Hi and welcome to the Formal Linear Perspective series. So I'm Professor Mark Leone and in this long lengthy uh, section which uh, hopefully will take uh, quite a bit of months and some years to get through all of it to show you the most structured uh, ways to see the world and to see uh, through drawing, through observation and perspective and capture that into the system of perspective that really not only, be not only belongs in drawing but it can belong in any art uh, training methodology that, that we have available to us. So it's, it's a way that we see, it's how we see, and that is the name of the title. So this, this lecture will explore just the very basic mechanics of how we do that. So how we see uh, is particularly important um, in the way that we organize, the way that we look at the world, so I'm going to write organize up here, the way that we observe the world, and how we can measure and we can quantify, if you will, or put it all together in a way that is provable and actually makes sense. This is how we see and it's been proved and it's been figured out. So Giotto came along in the late Gothic era and was using intuitive perspective. He almost had it and then Brunelleschi came along and solidified one-point perspective then later on two-point perspective and now we also have even uh, three-point perspective. So now we're into the 21st century and we still use this methodology today. So whether we're where you're, you're drawing or you're painting or you're sculpting or you're in video or film, all these little, little uh, uh, titles for what I'm talking about down here. Um, if you're using that, you're still using perspective today, especially in film, video, drawing, and painting. We're always using uh, linear perspective in some very uh, f informal kind of way most often and then sometimes uh, quite formal as well. So that, again, this particular lection, lecture will take us all the way through the very basic mechanics. I have 25 total illustrations or 25 total total plates to show you and in that time I'll talk about what we're seeing, what we carry with us, why, how, what it looks like how to set things up, and then we'll go into very physical demonstrations after this first lecture of how we see. And just stay with me, and I'll take you as deep as you want to go. So one, one piece of advice is to slow it down, slow me down. If I go too fast, stop, refresh, but draw along with me. So let's draw together and work unified together and really start to solidify your skill sets even more professionally and strongly. So as we get started, this is plate number one. What are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at a one-point perspective setup of just letter forms, how we see. And I've got some things around here that may look uh, alien to you. For instance, this long, thick line that goes down the middle, kind of like a telescope sight line here, right? And then also across here, I'm going to talk to you very soon about what these two lines represent and why they're important, our center of vision and our eye line and how we carry that around with us. I call that, these are two parts of our fundamental four. I call it my fun four. And it just is abbreviation for fundamental four, or it's also because hopefully we're having fun in drawing too. Um, so number one is up here, our center of vision, or CV, center of vision. And then number two over here is our uh, eye line. So that's where our eye is connected to. So center of vision, eye line. The number four over here is our cone of vision, this great big large circle. Later on I'll talk about what happens in our cone of vision. And what happens even outside our cone of vision makes sense too as well. And then one thing we can't see down below is our station point number three. And I'll talk about it later. And that's where we're located. And we have two of us. There's our real self when we look out from the center of our 
of our eyes through the, the kind of our, our middle eye, if you will, to the center of our, right between our eyes, out and looking at this phrase, how we see, but we can also quantify that with another figure down below in the ground. So there's always two of us when we observe and when we draw, okay? So pretty wild stuff there, I think, and hopefully um, if, you, if you go through me all the way, you'll get to understand why this is important. I can't uh, express deeply how important this is to the way you're seeing. So drawing, painting, film, video, sculpture, ceramics, art education, illustration, certainly. But putting together the formal mechanics of how we compose, how we operate, how we crop, how we change, how we alter, it's right here in perspective. And we'll talk about one, two-point, three-point perspective. We'll talk about the four basic rules of perspective and how they can govern just about anything you want to do. Okay, so I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Stay tuned. We just got through plate number one, and now we'll go on through plate number two. All right, here we are with plate number two. So what we're looking at in plate number two is an illustration of an eye and an object and essentially a basic exercise or a basic understanding, if you will, of how we see the object and how it comes to our eye. So we have the object over here, and that could be anything. We just kind of have an obelisk over here. It could be... It could be a, a ball, or it could be, you know, beach ball. It could be a box. Uh, it could be a tiger, if you will, or it could be a lion or a cat, or it could be, you know, a human figure, if you will. Doesn't really matter right now what it is, but any object that we have that we're seeing is going to present a series of of light to us through light rays down here below, uh, you know, you can quantify light that I understand it in physics is two things, as photons, okay, or as particles, and then also as beams or rays, and, and we're as interested as in beams and rays as anything. I think they both both help us to see. But we have an object, and these rays will move into and be enveloped into our eye and so that we can begin to create a projection onto our eyeball. And as I understand it, the eye corrects that vision. It comes in through the, the lens, the cornea, comes into the back and goes upside down and our brain transfers that image right side up. So we see objects again through rays of light. And if what one thing that you also notice here is how in this exercise it also diminishes. This is going to be very important for us later on very quickly as we begin to see that we can quantify this world from a great distance and from great large objects into diminished objects that retain the same kind of relative to one another kinds of measurements, even without even measuring, that give us a, a true picture of nature, but in a manageable way, a smaller way, on a piece of tracing paper or a piece of, of glass that we can observe the observable world, right, and then make it our own because we can minimize, or at least in terms of the scale of what we're seeing, to a more reasonable scale on a piece of paper. For instance, if this is a 30-foot obelisk here, right, well, this is also a 30-foot obelisk here down below. That may be a little bit, well, will be a lot more manageable to draw, right, at this stage than it will be, you know, having to draw a 30-foot man, man uh, obelisk all the time. So what we're seeing here again is the movement of light from an object to our eye or to your eye or to somebody else's eye and then of course it comes into our vision and then of course we understand that and we receive that information and then we can put it back down on a piece of paper or whatever it is that we're drawing with digitally whatever um, and make it work work for us 
uh, in the composition. So again, you know, we are seeing and understanding objects through this very simple, clear vision, hopefully that most of us can have in relating these objects quite well and then of course laying them down. So whether they're laying down or whether they're tilted or whatnot, they are coming in and receding into our eye. Okay? All right, let's go on to plate three. Okay, so what we have in front of us now in plate three is a series of illustrations that show our viewer's eye, us, we'll say this is us, the artist, and it shows a, what I'm going to call a piece of tracing paper, or you could think of it as a piece of glass, something that we can see through that is transparent. Then we're going to see an object, and it could be just like our obelisk in this one. So I have the object, and then I have a line demonstrating its height here and here. In the next one, we have points or dots that I'll talk about in a moment that we can project out and see and show where their distance is and how that is quantified on a surface. And then in the third one down here, we have an object that's lower sitting on the ground and how we see these distances and why and what's happening. And of course, the fourth one uh, is spaces in through here as well. So let's go on to now the first one. I'll move up here and I will blow this up a little bit so you can see this really nicely and cleanly and clearly these illustrations. So our first setup in terms of how we see here, we have the artist's eye or your eye or my eye. Now we're looking at a side view of how we see. And we have again our piece of glass here or I'm going to call it a piece of tracing paper. I think that's a little bit more interesting. And so we can actually draw on this surface. We can actually, you know, make marks across here. So I'm going to make a few marks just to show you that. So what we're looking at in our vision, we are relating to an object back here. So this is actually the physical 3D object in our little composition. So we're seeing that object. And what we're understanding now is we see that object as it's coming closer to us in terms of the light that's giving off, the re reflection and refraction of light coming to us. We can understand now that if we take a red pencil in this case, right, and we make a mark on our piece of paper set to us upright, parallel, in this, in this case parallel to the object, we can make a mark that signifies that in our space that this object is the same object but now it's receded towards us but it's also six foot so let's say this object here is a total of six feet tall in our in our our diagram well it recedes towards us it doesn't change its physical size what happens it diminishes in our view as it comes towards us it gets smaller and smaller but it retains its same measurement right here, right here, right here, right? These are all six foot. And then when we get to our piece of paper, our tracing paper, we can prove that by showing that this mark is also six foot in perspective, in diminishment. So we're showing here how we see that we see through a series of rays, but also diminished size in terms of perspective. And that's marked with on our piece of tracing paper right here set up, or glass, if you will, either way, in our composition. Okay, let's move on to our next illustration over here. So we have our next illustration, and we have three, three points of interest in our composition. So we have point number one over here to the right. Okay, point number one here. We have point number two, okay, and point number three. All right. So there's some interesting things going on now on our piece of tracing paper and from our eye. So here's our eye. Okay. Here's our height here as we're viewing the objects. And we're looking slightly down on three. We have two we see that's further out from our eye. And then, of course, we have one that's even much further out. We can understand that, I think, all pretty well. However, what we start to notice when we have and we mark these on our tracing paper is that this. The closer the object 
to us in our composition, the lower it will be on that marked piece of paper, that plain surface. So remember, we're looking through like a piece of transparent tracing paper or glass, right? So this is transparent. I'll just put transparent here. And we're looking through completely through and then we're demarcating where that falls on our piece of paper you've got perspective right in front of you so three is lower right two is a little higher why because two is further away from point three so two would be marked higher up on our picture plane this is also I'll put PP here for picture plane or we can, yeah, picture plane will be fine, or P and PL. I think that'll be just as good. So our picture plane is up here. And then lastly, dot number one over here is furthest away, and it will be even higher up in our composition. So the further away an object is, the higher up we will relate that to our surface in perspective. We're giving perspective in diagrammatic in visual structure to our drawing now through perspective. So let's review this one really quickly. Points three, two, and one. Three is closest to us. Three is the lowest in our composition. Two is in the middle. It happens to fall in this particular diagram a little bit right in the middle. And then look how far away one is, but it's so far away it, it shows up a little bit higher, but le look how they're almost relatively even spaced on our, our diag diag diagrammatic composition. So the further away, the higher up, the closer to us, the lower down in our perspective composition. All right, so let's move on to our next one. Let me recede this out a little bit, and let's come over to our next illustration. Let's go back to hand in through here. All right, so let's come down in through here. All right, let's take a look. Okay, so illustration now number three. <coughs> Move it over. There we go. Let's bump it up so we can see it even better. So now we have two objects that are of equal height in our composition sitting on a ground plane and what do you notice about from our last little discussion till now so object number two is decidedly closer to us let's say they're both two feet in height right so they're 24 let's put inches 24 inches in height so we have 24 inches in height object two and also object number one but what do you notice about how when we look at the object from a distance, right, and we notice that one is pushed off much further away, what happens when we observe them and mark them on our piece of tracing paper? Well, two, since it is closer, becomes further down our composition, so we can see that here, correct? Further down our composition. But also, what do you notice here? A little bit taller, a little bit larger right in through here as well. Object number one being the same height at 24 inches. Also, further away, so it's higher up our composition, right? But also, what do you notice? It has diminished in size to show that we have now perspective in our composition. Now, because we're looking at this diagram straight on, our two objects here don't diminish in size. But if we turn our view, I'll show you here, and we're looking now through our piece of glass, we're going to see object one here, right? And we're going to see object two here, like so. They're both 24 inches, but one is closer to us. One is also larger than right the other and closer to us in perspective. So this is a good illustration to show you that two objects of equal height, when looked at and drawn in perspective, the closest object will be closer and larger. The further object will be farther away and smaller and diminished, but also, what do you notice, higher up 
on a composition as well. All right. So let's move on to our next perspective understanding here. So with this diagram, now we have designated spaces, and it illustrates the same kind of understanding that we just had from our last diagram. Matter of fact, we can pull them all together, pull all, all four of them all together too as well, and kind of see what's going on in our composition. So as we have our piece of tracing paper here now, right here, right, our piece of glass that we can mark on, we can see that space A is a little bit larger than space B, but not by a whole lot, right? Space B is kind of the negative space. But look at space C. Look how big it is compared to space A. It's a little bit larger than, right, space A. But when we quantify that in perspective on a surface, we've got to be careful to show receding understanding or diminishment understanding on that perspective surface. So therefore, because we can align up a point on our eye here, our station point, right, right here. Okay, let me go back and get my pen. Sure, I have my pen. Move us all over the place. Right in through here and connect it up with these spaces right down below. We can have an accurate understanding as they meet our picture plane of our drawing surface. In this case, a piece of transparent tracing paper right in through here right all the way down and we notice then that how strongly their diminishment changes their size as they go further and further right and further away from our eye that's probably the biggest understanding of what we're trying to get across to you right now in perspective is that not only do the spaces show up lower when they're closest to us, right, especially on a level ground, but that as they recede from our eye, even if they're larger spaces, they're still going to go up the picture plane, they'll go higher, and they'll get dramatically smaller and smaller as they go again further, 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 and further, and further away from our eye. Very important understanding to to get in your vision and get um, kind of acclimated to the constructs of perspective you already understand this intuitively you already have a built-in visual accruement to or if that's the right word or a, a, a connection to the observable world world but as artists we want to understand the mechanics of what we're seeing and how and be able to manipulate it further and here's the real reason we don't want to get bogged down in all the technical uh, mechanics it's very technical yes it is and we want it to be but we don't want to get bogged down we want to be masters of it so we want to be creative right over the technical we want to master our technical so very much that the creativity is the dominant force of the understanding. I hear a lot of students say and other professionals, well, you know, when you do perspective drawings, they kind of look uh, a little, little distorted or abstract. They don't look like reality. And it's not true because, number one, you're probably drawing further outside the cone than you ever needed to be. And number two, this is how we see. We have to be able to relate mechanically how we see, technically how we see, and understand it and control it for for your your, your vision, creative vision to really take over and take a hold. But that's the number, number one thing is for your creativity to take over and be dominant over the technical aspects of the composition or what you're drawing or what you're painting as well. So we're talking mainly about drawing, but again, I'm, I want you to relate to everything that you're seeing and how you put that down on any kind of particular surface where you're, you know, you're scribing onto a piece of clay or whatnot. You're still, you still want to understand the mechanics of perspective. Okay, so there we go. That was the, uh, I believe, number plate number one, two, uh, three in our composition. And again, we looked at how 
we see objects here and how we can relate them on to a drawing surface in how their size diminishes but their relationships, their measurable relationships can stay the same, how they diminish but also how they can be quantified larger, clo well not necessarily larger but closer objects to our eye will recede and go lower down the picture plane and then objects further away from us, right? In the, the bottom two illustrations here and here will go higher as they get further away, but they'll also get much, much, much smaller too as well. Okay, let's move on to the next plate. So now here we're at plate uh, number four, I believe, and we're looking at the, the the same kind of setup that we just looked at. Now we're looking at it from above. So I'll write that up here. So we're from above, and we're looking straight down onto what is ourselves. And this is just a diagram of an eye. So we're looking out here. Here's our station point. Here's where rays are coming in to our eye here and also here. So what our setup is now is we're talking about width and perspective. We have the edge of a glass of a picture plane or this could be your tracing paper or it could be a piece of plexiglass that we, you could actually go out physically set this up in front of you sit down or stand and have a piece of plexiglass ready and available. You could for instance you could set yourself up here we are right here right and we could have maybe in um, some kind of stand and maybe clips and then have a piece of plexiglass here that we have or if we had a huge piece of plexiglass like that or we could have you know a, uh, on an easel a piece of tracing paper that we could see through that we could quantify that that would certainly help so that's kind of what I'm talking about here too if you're still a little bit kind of confused which you might be my job is to give you in these first essential 25 plates is as much information about the basic mechanics, your true be, you know, beginning introduction to how we see and why. So some of you may already draw it pretty well. I have a lot of students here that already draw and paint really well, but they don't know how to fully understand how they see and how to take advantage of how they see in one, two, and three point perspective understandings and also three point auxiliary understandings. And that's my job here now is to get you to another heightened level. But I'm throwing out a lot of terminology. I'm throwing a lot of audit information here that we'll go back over through formal perspective, which will go on for a long time and be, its again, it's its own separate section in the playlist, and you'll always have that to go over. But uh, this is your best way to begin to understand the mechanical, physical world that we see and then draw it. Uh, naturally, creatively, technically, and also very relaxed too as well. And so getting back here, we're talking about width and perspective. Uh, so we're looking out through, again, our piece of tracing paper, our piece of plexi if you want, or our glass, and we have two uh, bars or rods or whatever it is that you want to think of them. Think of them steel bars, right? And they're the same length. Let's say, just for the sake of it, they're both uh, six feet in length. So that's a six feet, six foot bar, and so is that. That's a six foot bar. What do you notice about bar number B? Well, or B is that it's pushed back in our composition from A. So we're looking at both of them. Okay, so that's important. Now, as A comes into our vision our width right, we notice that they're both the same width across, so we see that, we've got that understanding, so I'll, I'll put another line so you can see that they're both the same width across, okay? There's nothing is different, there's no mumbo jumbo or magic, there's no magic, it's just observational science. What do you notice about bar A as it comes in? Well, it ends here on our piece of tracing paper right there, so that's the width that we see and that what we would draw that we could actually physically draw out on our piece of tracing paper or plexiglass right there. But look at, look at bar B. So that rod is pushed back and distance. What do you notice about that? Well, it now, because it's further away from us, we, the tracing as it comes into our vision, look how much smaller it is now diminished, right? 
than bar A. That's pretty important to understand. I think that's pretty pretty remarkable to demonstrate and to be able to prove through these some of these beginning plates how perspective actually truly is quantifiable, understandable, proven, can be proved and has been proved. I really don't even have to do it anymore, but I, I want to show these show these to you and look look at the look at the major difference. So just pushing it back a little bit, look how much smaller it becomes in our drawing. So that's a pretty amazing understanding. So we're talking about width here, but we could also understand if we could flip this this piece of paper back up, what we would also notice is that bar A would be here underneath, bar B would also be a little bit higher. Why? Remember, because it's further away from us in our composition. So not only do objects recede, they go higher up the picture plane, but they also get smaller. Their widths get smaller, especially if they're parallel and if they're the same length, they will get smaller and smaller. So we could have a rod C of the same length, then we could have a rod D, and so on. And look how that begun. If you look at this little diagram over here, look how those all those rods would be the same uh, same, understandably the same length and width, but would get smaller and smaller. And then, of course, if we had another rod that was even closer, it would get even even larger uh, in our composition. So pretty pretty important stuff to look at and think about and really begin to understand why in our composition. So if you draw really well, you're already going to be able to understand this. Now you can be able to ingest it, practice it, and then draw more creatively out of your own imagination. So we're trying to connect the technical, right, to your creativity, which is always key. Creativity over the technical. But when you align the two, you have what? You have mastery. And that's what we're trying to get at. We're not trying, not trying to slow you down or to confuse you. I might confuse you at times, but quite frankly, that's a good thing. It means you're probably learning and growing and doing things that you haven't understood before, and that's part of my, my job here at NKU and then uh, also in YouTube land out there is to stump you a little bit, challenge you, and to bring about your best um, qualities or traits as an artist and make you, quite frankly, make you grow, make you better. Okay, So we just demonstrated and we just proved how perspective can show widths of the same length right, but as they recede, they get smaller in width now. Okay, We saw it in length and height in the other illustrations, but now we can start to see it in length. We can see how rod B is now smaller than or less wide or narrower now in rod A when before, when they were both the same size up above, right, they were not. Pretty powerful stuff. Okay, let's go on to the next illustration. Okay, so in plate number five, plate number five, we are looking now at the horizon line. I can't tell you how important the horizon line and understanding where the horizon line is, what it is, how we get it, and how we distort it, uh, quite frankly, a little bit in, uh, in our observation is going to be very important to you in your drawing uh, practice. So let's take a look now and see what we're seeing. So quickly, we have four different sub-illustrations here. Number one, number two, number three, and number four. So we're kind of looking at them all together. So what do you notice that there's a horizon line or an implied one throughout one, uh, two, right, three, and number four. And number four is the most different, right, than the other three. And let's talk about why that will be in a moment. So we're going to start at one and get down to four and talk about why that's different. So let's go back to the first one. Let's blow it up a little bit. Let's move it into our view and let's analyze what we're seeing uh, in terms of how we understand the horizon line. So um, you all understand that we live on a sphere, the earth, right? So we have our earth here and we all understand, I hope you understand, that it's round. So it's round and it's three-dimensional, okay? So we understand that. We don't live in a flat world anymore, uh, at least in terms of um, reality. So 
on this globe or sphere, of course, we have the center of the core of the earth, which is, I believe, nickel and iron. It's pretty hot throughout, a squeeze gravity that comes in, 360. We can say then that we are pretty tiny. I'm just going to quantify us with little dots, right? That's what these dots show us, but we're obviously even tinier than that. So if we're pushed off the earth, we're in a satellite up here some way, and we're looking down on the earth, this is what we might see. Out here is what we would understand then, where I'm putting these darker marks to co go over what I've drawn, is what we could see as a horizon line. This could curve over if we could come through it and be inside. Horizon line, horizon line, horizon line. Maybe out here would be a horizon line. Okay, and our little dot is where we are on the surface looking out to that horizon line. What do you notice about the lines that I'm drawing? They're all curved, radically curved. So the dimension of, you know, a sphere, if we draw a sphere here, that's pretty, you know, pretty rounded. So we're looking at that rounded surface. So our horizon line to us is, is rounded. So it's demonstrated then that the horizon line would be round, right? Why would we draw our horizon line, or not round, but curved like that? Well, I'll, I'll show you why as we go further. So illustration number two kind of shows that what I just had up here a little bit clearer and more resolute coming down. So here we are as the artist looking out at our horizon line. Our vision here could extend out even further in our cone. We have a cone of vision. I'll talk about that a little bit. And you notice again that horizon line is pretty cur curved over through here. So we're a little bit closer in now from illustration two. We go over to illustration three and we get a little closer in. It's not quite as curved. Okay, so this might be from a spaceship looking down. So we get even a little less curve with our horizon, but still no less the curvature of the Earth, the earth makes, that, makes that round. But when we come down to illustration number four, because we are so tiny, so minuscule on the surface or the skin of that ball, as we live right on the top of the... Um, the lithosphere, if you will, of the stone, you know, the quality of the Earth's surface, right, the crust, if you will, that we don't see much of any curve at all. And so we quantify all our perspective in a horizon line is pretty, pretty straight, which is pretty amazing. Um, so the actual, our actual horizon line then, um, in true nature, is certainly curved, right? We know that now. We've seen it. Go take a look at the Earth. You can see that. You can't get in a spaceship yet. Maybe one day you will. Hopefully you will. And you'll see that it's curved, but because we're so close in, because of our scale, the minuscule quality of who we are, this horizon line now is straight. We are straight as an arrow here. Okay, so here we are down here. Here we are as the artist. There's our station point. Right here, here's our little diagram of us down here, a little guy. That's you and I. And we're looking, or girl, can be. And we're looking to the horizon. It's a flattened perspective, okay? And we're looking at, now we'll say maybe that, oh, I don't know, maybe this distance between our horizon line that we're looking at in our station point here this view could be let's say 15 15 feet okay so we could flap ourselves up i'm kind of getting ahead of myself but we could flap ourselves up and come right here and there's our station point too so this is us here as well but this is us 15 feet towards you and i as we look at this video this comes right through the center of our eyes, right? You have two eyeballs, left and right. This comes right through the middle of them in our monocular vision, out, 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 out this way, right? And this also demonstrates, this little setup all in through here demonstrates what I'm calling our view 15 feet away. And so this horizon line that we see straight now and not curved anymore separates our sky plane from our ground plane. 
Everything above now is sky. Everything below is ground. The horizon line is truly level at zero degrees. Okay, so the horizon line will be used often in our discussions, often in our composition, and also in this case, the horizon line is also connected to our eye level. They're also one in the same. They don't always have to be. We'll demonstrate that soon enough, but they can also be changed as well, meaning that if we look at here, I'll diagram this here, and let me get my pen back. So if we're standing here as our little person here, and we're looking out, our eye level might change to our horizon line from a distance. It could be looking up or down, so that would be our new eye level, but of course our horizon line would not change. So they don't always have to be connected. They do in one point, in two point perspective, that's what makes one point in two point perspective what it is, is because our eye is attached and does not move off the horizon line. But when it does, and it will, and it often does in your own life, think about when your head is straight, or you're relaxing, and then you see a bird flying over, or you see a squirrel, or you look down that your, your dog or your cat comes over and they want attention, you look down at them, but you don't really change your body or your head much. You look down, right, your head moves down. You're changing the degrees of which your vision is moving, and it's resetting every time. And in that case, it's going to be three-point three, three point perspective. And your eye is moving off of the horizon line. So we'll get into all that. So once you start to know that, hopefully it'll blow your mind a little bit. And once it starts to blow your mind, you can start to understand why we see and draw the things and the shapes and the forms that you do and that you're drawing it already well. So if you're drawing well, you're already understanding intuitively shape, how shape in form and the understanding of receding lines are starting to work out for you, but you may not know the real reasons why and how you can set that up in just from your imagination, not just from observation. You can get it some from observation, but you can understand it technically and set it up from your imagination, from observation, and from photographic reference, and also correct where their distortion's at, when we because we do have quite a bit of distortion too as well. Okay, so this was plate five, the horizon line. Let's go now on to plate six and learn a little bit more, I believe, about station points. Okay, so welcome to plate six. So now we're looking at, and we're going to define, two other aspects of our vision. Remember, we just described what horizon line was. That's the separation from the sky plane, from the ground plane, which in one point and two point perspective can be and is connected to our eye level, the level at which we see. Okay, Now we're taking a look at what and why, not necessarily how yet, but where objects can be receding to, and that is this term here, which is our vanishing point. So we have a vanishing point, and then we come over here and we show our station point. So we have our little girl here, our figure, our inquisitive, uh, bright, smart young woman, and she's got a station point right between her eyes. That demonstrates kind of your third eye or your monocular vision. So if I draw it over here, so if we had one eye here, right, looking, and we had another eye here looking, right, and of course you have your nose coming down, right, in through here, little mouth, right, whatever, through there. This is what I'm talking about right here. Your next, your perspective vision, monocular. So we can take your best vision in with your two eyes, if you're not 20-20, which I'm not anymore, and we can say this is our SP, this is our station point right there between, between her eyes, between your eyes as you look out. So we're looking at a level side view of our viewer, the artist, our young girl, and she's looking through a telescope right at her eye level. And when she looks out, that singular vision where objects disappear to that is her vanishing point. And this vanishing point would be a one point for right now. It would also be right in the center of her center of vision and at her eye level, which be, would be right there, which also, by the way, right, looks just like her telescope, doesn't it? Looking through a telescope 
lens right through at her at her eye level of her station point. Now let's say she's uh, five foot. Let's say she's 15 years old and she's five foot. Let's say she's five foot one inch tall. Okay. Her station point then, center of her eyes is not the top of her head. So her station point out here, she might be what? She might, her station point then might be four feet, let's say 11 inches tall. So it's a little bit, little bit shorter than your true uh, height, the top of your head, okay? So again, remember, it's right there in the center between your two eyes, so looking out. So we've quantified now our station point, haven't we? We've said station point, looking out directly opposite where true disappearance and diminishment happens. This is diminishment. Diminish. Let me just make sure I get my spelling correct. Diminishment. Okay. It's probably a good thing I'm not teaching a spelling English class because that's not my expertise. <laughs> All right, so diminishment, true diminishment from the station point to a singular point out there that gives us our vanishing point. So our vocabulary, horizon line, right, HL, VP for vanishing point. We can have several different types of vanishing points later on. And what do you notice here? Eye level. Here's also her eye level, too, as well. So EL, right, for eye level. And then over here, station point, right, SP for station point. Station point is us, where we look from. Um, because we're looking out from her, our station, we can see her station point outwards. If we, if we assume her identity and we look through that telescope right back over here, okay, we're looking through that telescope, okay, here's her horizon line, which is now, right now, also her eye level, okay, we haven't talked about her center of vision yet, I'll label that CV, but that comes straight down the middle, right down the old, the old middle there of her, of her station point, right? And then this middle point, our vanishing point right now, also connects up to our station point, which is actually, if this distance between her telescope station point and the vanishing point, I'll say this is 100, let's say she's looking, no, that wouldn't make sense. Let's say it's uh, 18 feet away. This is what life would look like 18 feet away from whatever it is that we're looking at out there in reality. Okay. Even though that we know her horizon line and that vanishing point, it ends in an infinitely great, great distance. So that's what 18 feet away would look like if she was looking at something out there. Okay. And I'll talk more about that station point, how that flaps up over in just a little bit. Okay. All right. So there we have vanishing point, station point, and also eye level as well as center of vision. Okay, let's move on to the next plate. Okay, now we have, I believe, plate number seven. And we're now looking at and talking about something probably maybe a little bit more difficult to, uh, to grasp is your station point. And I'm going to make this even more manifest or more, more realized in a physical lecture I'll do after... I do this lecture, the How We See lecture. I'll do some some uh, understandings and some dem illustrations or demonstrations where I physically show you a few, few things too as well. And hopefully this can clear up any misunderstanding with your station point as well. So let's look deeply, if you will, at this diagram. I know this is pretty dry, but hang with me. It's important. If it wasn't important, I wouldn't waste your time with it. So let's take a look and see what we have out here. So the first thing that we have now is we see that we have a horizon line, correct? Check. So that's our horizon line. Here's our sky plane. Here's our ground plane down below, which is also the case with our eye level. So we have our eye level, and it's connected to uh, in in connected to our horizon line. So our eyes are glued to, here's our eye, they are glued to our horizon line looking out. Now, what's interesting about this, this vision, 
we see our little guy, our little lady down here. Right, there's our station point, that little dot. Okay, and we have our little person down here that we're looking down on, correct? So I'll go in a little bit deeper so you can see that. Now, that represents us too as well. How far away are we from the horizon line vision here, our center point, our vanishing point? How far are we away? Well, I've made 20 marks, equal marks, down below that show us we are 20 feet away in our composition. So at 20 feet. This is us looking at 20 feet. Now, we are also looking at this piece of paper that we're drawing. You and I together, we can see it the same way as 20 feet as well. So if I put a little box, I'm going to draw a little box out here. Maybe not so little. This, these all are represent a foot. This is about one, two, three feet tall, right? And this in about four feet wide. And this diminishes to our vanishing point. And we'll end it about a foot in perspective length, right in through there. So that's what that looks like. That box looks like at 20 feet away. It's about a three-foot tall box, so it's like a, uh, an old TV set or a piece of furniture could be in that, right? So that's what we see 20 feet away. What we also can demonstrate that in a two-dimensional sense, more abstractly, or 2D vector sense, down here below at our little person down here, right, at 20 feet away. So let me... Let me move this around and, and talk a little bit further. Maybe really, really get this concept honed in your mind. There's two of us looking now at our box, our setup. There is our little person here, which represents us. He's universally us in a two-dimensional way. Then there's you and I. I can't tell what you look like. You can't tell what I look like. You know why? We're sharing the same vision. So we're looking out. At, from our head, our eye, and we see this box, this three-foot box, okay, at about a 20-foot vision from us. It's pulled in about six or seven feet from our, from our ending diminishment, and we see this box now, this one-point box, about three feet or so tall, four feet wide roughly, relatively, the same way that our little person down here would do it. So we can see it two ways. And this helps later on when we do measurement, when we do other perspective drawings, is that we have our two-dimensional measuring person down there, which also relates to our reality of our scene that we see out in the three-dimensional world. So in order to explain this, it's like taking a flap of yourself down here, and this is what I'm trying to demonstrate. If we flap this upwards, this 20-foot line here, right here, whoops, Sorry about that. I always do that. That's my calling card from now on is one. I've got to have always one good, good flip, right? So if we take that and we flap that up, right? Up, up, up. Flip it up, flip it up, flip it up where it comes straight at us. Where we couldn't see a top or a bottom and that dot comes, or this line comes straight at us. All we would see was a dot. That would be a 20-foot line. Okay, so this distance right here, okay, get this in your, start to get this in your, your mind. If you don't get it clearly, that's okay. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to explain it to you a lot from, from here going forward. This is 20 feet away, coming right from and to our station point between our eyes, our third eye, right, between our eyes and all the way out to the horizon line and our eye level and ends on the horizon line. It also can be then flapped back down, right, and made into 20 feet away flat 2D, and that's where we are down here. So when we rise ourselves up, 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 up to here, we're standing up straight, and we're saying there we are 20 feet away. And this is what we could see. We could see a box in our composition, and I'll put a little shadow on it so we can see that in our composition and there we are so our station point so very important 
is the distance from the horizon line, and this can be called a distance line. I'll label it right now a DL, and that will make sense later on when you want to do very accurate drawings at certain distances or see what it looks like and measure from certain distances. You can do that. You can do this in drawing for concepts, for animation, for film, for cartoons, whatever it is that you want and they need a certain look at a certain distance, you'll be able to do that. And that's the important parts of this is to be able to quantify this a little bit more clearly. So in illustration number three here, it shows what I just talked about. The station point again comes right at us, you and I. And so again, we quantified it over here to the left, right? by flapping it down and so it came down this way but now I'm showing you when we really see out here what we see out in the natural world out here in our little picture plane we're at 20 feet away we'll say we're at still at 20 feet this is what it would look like here's our sky here's our ground okay and so that's truly important to understand that we flap that person up in our composition. So let's go down one and take a look at little illustration number four here and this is what I'm talking about. So this is you and I here, right here, right? Let me go in a little bit closer so we can see it. This is you and I here at the top looking in. Somebody's looking at the side of us, right? So somebody stepped away, a friend of yours stepped away and took a photograph of you and I, and here we are looking out at the world, okay? So that's what we would look like. But then we could also say that from our station point, this distance here and here, if it's 20 feet, it would also be 20 feet down, right, in straight perpendicular down here. So there's our also ourselves here and here, our abstract selves, that's 2D. This is our 3D view out into the world, and this is our 2D world down through here. And we can have both in our drawing at the same time, because our 2D world, when he looks or he or she looks out, or you look out, they're seeing the same thing from a flapped down position. Okay, we have flapped, flapped down, and we're seeing the same thing from our flapped up position. And of course, now we're just being photographed looking outward just to demonstrate the flap position. So that's the brief concept of our station point, which is one of our four fundamentals that we're going to get familiar with very quickly here. And so let's pull out, pull back a little bit and refresh, review what we just saw. It's maybe a little bit harder to demonstrate is that we made our, gave ourselves a horizon line and we said that's also our eye level. So our eyes are locked in to the horizon line. Now we can see up and down a little bit, points of view somewhat, okay? But our eyes are locked. We can't tilt our head down and over or up and down, so we can't tilt. And we said, okay, this is the sky plane and this is the ground plane down below. We have a station point our vanishing point, excuse me, which also is our center of vision. It's directly on through. And then we said our station point would be 20 feet down from station point to vanishing point on the horizon line. So we demarcated 20 equal measurements to give us 20 feet. This is what a 3 foot by 4 foot box relatively would look like from 20 feet away if we were drawing it out in our 3D world out here, but also in our own 2D world looking from down here out. This person has the same vision as if our flapping up of our station point, our 2D person to our 3D person in outward. And I'm going to show you what that looks like physically in a lecture after this one. I'll do some more demonstrations of a white cube and I'll show you a station point with a string or a steel wire and how that can be flapped down and above. It's really important to understand, and once you get the concept, it becomes clear as to how measurement, measuring lines and distance lines can be the uh, perfect way to give 
accurate allusion to an interior space, for instance, or an interior, you know, scene that has perfect distance between a three-foot chair and a six-foot person and a, uh, walls that are 12 feet uh, tall and looking out a window at a 15 by 20 foot swimming pool for instance you can you can get you can get very accurate with that even if you're you're just quick doing quick relaxed simple form or even more relaxed perspective as well all right so the concept of station point very important there's two of us there's one 3d person looking out in the world and then there's your 2d version down in the ground Okay, let's move on to the next. All right, plate number eight. So let's talk a little bit about clarifying up the station point even further and a little bit about point of view. So we have three little distinctive illustrations here. And we have, let's go to the middle illustration really quickly. You know what this is already, right? So we're seeing in our middle, middle view, we have our station point at 12 feet away, our little person down here. Let's call her a female now, our little, our little lady down here. She's got longer hair, just to show that off. Okay, there's her station point, and she's 12 feet away from the vanishing point, the horizon line in our, in our, uh, our composition. That's 12 feet away. Let's say now that we have a obelisk, a rectangular form out here, and for illustration's sake, this is what this obelisk, or platform, if you will, would look like at 12 feet away. So here's our 12-foot self, and then when we, herself, and when we come over, this is what her 12-foot away self, excuse me, would look like. She's not 12 feet. We'll say she's, again, 5'1". Five, five her station points at 4'11". And this is what she would see coming out from her vision so you and I now share her vision and that's what this is about in in perspective drawing is sharing our vision with you in a three-dimensional you know kind of way so we'll put 3d share and we're seeing it all together so we're we're 12 feet now from horizon technically vanishing point here this is what this would look like coming out so we have three platforms now this is below our eye level Right, so we're looking down on now this little platform, so we see the top of it. This is interesting. This one here, since we are looking at neither the top right or the bottom, we see just the side. So it's in our relative eye level, and that can be pushed and manipulated a little bit over here. This distance, this we could come up a little bit, down a little bit, as long as this horizon line stays within we were seeing through this object a little bit we wouldn't see the top or bottom now if we raise it up enough to this object here right we see the bottom why because now we're looking up at the object it's raised above our eye level and we see the bottom one this is raised below right our eye level and now we see the top this whole concept is called point of view and a really important aspect to drawing is point of view. What is your point of view to the objects that you're drawing? Is it, is it relative eye level? Is it at relatively above your eye levels? You, so you see the bottom of objects, the bottom of forms, or is it relatively below your eye level? So you're seeing the, the true top you know, uh, of a form. And I think that's important to know, important to practice and exercise. Where is your location relative to the objects that you see? Well, in this, in this case, we have our eye level, which also over here in her, in our middle view, this is also, remember, this is eye level too as well. So that represents this line over in our first diagram and of course we have her horizon line so eye level and also HL for horizon line are both connected since this is still one point point. and of course she's 12 feet away from our understanding of the horizon line and her vanish in her the vanishing point our station point is right there so that's her there this is also us up here getting when we look up to understand that we see this world here as well okay very important 
to to understand that this world here to the left, the 3D world, is flapped up, just like we would see it through her eyes or a telescope, if you will, in this world over here is flapped down in a more two-dimensional world. Okay, so if we move over to the final uh, diagram here, if you will, for station point, let's move it over. I'll bring it over just a little bit. We can see just another idea of the flapping idea. I want you to get that in your mind. So if you could crush yourself into the earth at 25 feet distance, the distance line from the vanishing point, right? 25 feet, okay, downward, or in this case upward, right, would be right here. Same thing. So we flap ourselves down. So station point flapped up, our 2D version here, our 3D version here, both at 25 feet away. And when we're at our 3D version, remember, it's as, look, as if we're looking through and seeing exactly what the viewer wants us, wants us to see in a natural kind of way. Whether we're looking through our eyes or through glasses or sunglasses or a telescope or some kind of extensive lens helping aid this is how we see the real world, the 3D world, but we can quantify that and measure it to help us out in our 2D world. And hopefully that will become very important later on as we use a station point for right angles, measuring for three-point perspective, uh, for all kinds of distances to get true, a true look of how things would look in our 3D world on our piece of paper, our two-dimensional picture plane. Because we live three-dimensionally, but the drawing that we make is a two-dimensional surface, we can, again, we have our two-dimensional lady or our person to help us out with that. So we're relating our, the reality of a flat surface with the understanding that we live three-dimensionally. Okay? All right, so there you go. Let's go on to the next plate. Oh, hey, welcome to plate nine. You've made it this far. So looking at this particular plate, the next four plates, 9, 10, 11, and 12, are I'm going to be discussing very quickly the four major rules of perspective. They're very four. They're pretty easy to remember, and you'll use uh, almost every rule at some point in time in your understanding of perspective. Okay, so the first rule is generally the rule of the vanishing point, or what I call the vanishing point rule. So, all receding lines, okay, that are in nature, that are man-made even, they're parallel. If they're parallel to one another, they're going to appear to meet at one and the same point, right there. So, it's the idea of the rule of the vanishing point. All parallel receding lines on a level surface generally, if they continue it far enough out to wherever we're going, they're going to recede at the same point, which sounds like the vanishing point, correct? All right, so if we look out over here now, I'll get my pen tool coming back. This rectangular slab here, there's no perspective. Why? Well, we're looking at it straight up, so it's just a shape. It's a rectangular, right, cubic form. Here's one over here, or it could be a box, or a, or a, a square, or it could be a triangle. It could be any shape. I think you get the idea. But there's no depth to it. These lines, would you agree, are parallel? in nature, correct? They're parallel. As they recede, now coming over into form, the second form over here, they are receding. We don't see anything else, right? But they are receding to a singular vanishing point. They're level, they're sitting down on a level surface, correct? And they are receding away from, from us to a point, right? and they're receding to a vanishing point. We could follow them together, of course, in that way we could find our vanishing point. And here we see it all together, where we see the vanishing point clearly right there. So rule number one, again, is that all lines, receding lines in nature, 
or they could be man-made, if they're parallel and they're parallel to one another, they're going to appear to meet at one and the same point. One and the same vanishing point. What's also important to remember is this little person here is that here's the eye level right there. That vanishing point will be on the eye line. Okay, that's another thing too. Now I've gotten ahead of myself by showing the horizon line here and that's going to be the next plate and the next rule. So rule number one, just remember that. That's the rule, all that fancy language I just used. You can remember it, memorize it too, but it's rule number one, right? And that's the rule of the vanishing point where we get our diminishment from, okay? Now looking back over here, this form, these forms here, this line here and this line here, they're parallel too, but they're not diminishing. These side forms will, okay? They'll diminish now. For, well, if we're coming to a one point, they would. I, we wouldn't here, but here they would too. So this line here, this line, this slab, this slide there, I don't want to confuse you, here and here, right? They go to a vanishing point. So all these parallel lines are receding in nature, and they're going to that one singular point, the vanishing point. So that's rule number one, the rule of the vanishing point. Okay, let's go on to plate number 10. Plate number 10 with rule number two. So the first rule, remember we have the rule of the vanishing point. All receding lines in nature or man-made that are parallel to one another, they're going to appear to go back to one point. Well, rule number two, guess what? It's pretty similar. Rule number two is the rule of what? The rule of the horizon line. I'll write that out there. It's the rule of the horizon line. And it's pretty much the same thing. So remember, when all parallel lines that are in nature or man-made, they're receding, they are going to recede to an end point on the horizon line. And they're going to appear to meet right at that same point on the horizon line. So essentially, that's illustrated here. That same point on the horizon line is that vanishing point there, the VP, and on the horizon line. If they're level, on a level ground surface, right, they're going to appear to recede in nature. These parallel lines, both our sides and our fronts, will all recede to and diminish to that vanishing point, and it will be located on the horizon line. So rule number two, two is the rule of the horizon line. Pretty easy to understand. Right? We've already been doing this, and you know it intuitively. Now, later on, we can break that rule. We can get it off the horizon line. Of course, that's going to be rule number three and rule number four. But for now, we have rule number one. All parallel, natural, or man-made receding lines will recede and appear to end at one singular point. And that's the vanishing point. Rule number one is the rule of the vanishing point. Rule number two is the rule of the horizon line. If they will recede and disappear to one point, and that one, one point will be located on the horizon. And this is assuming, again, coming over here to our little female figure, that she's going to be, her eye will be eye level and on and connected to the eye line. So look what happens here. So if we work a little bit and move this around, we see these platforms, these slabs moving right down to the vanishing point, disappearing. So these horizontal lines correspond to the same measurement or the same length or width as before. So if they are, oh, let's say they're pretty big. Let's say they're 10 feet across. So this is 10 feet across. This is 10 feet across. This is still 10 feet, 10 feet, way down here, way down here, and almost becomes a dot as they disappear from our view to the horizon line. They're parallel they're diminishing, they're diminishing to a vanishing point, and they're diminishing to the vanishing point, which is located, yep, you guessed it, right on the horizon line. Same thing with these outside lines. 
they are diminishing they are converging to i like to call converging and diminishing to a point a vanishing point which is located right on the horizon line so there it is for you rule number one and rule number two in perspective all parallel lines that are receding they will recede away from us to a point on the horizon line vanishing point rule horizon line rule pretty easy stuff we've got two more to cover and let's do that now let's go on to the next plate all right welcome back to plate 11 let's take a look at rule number three in rule number four so this plate you get two for the price of one how about that for a discount so if rule number one in rule number two explain the vanishing point and the horizon line we're pretty much set in but what happens if something tilts up or if it tilts down so rule number three in rule number four deal with perspective on the incline which is rule number three so we're just going to call rule number three perspective of the incline in rule number four perspective of the decline so rule number three is essentially if all disappearing or we'll call it the still receding lines and they're in nature right and they're going to be parallel to one another if they're inclined upwards they're going to appear to meet at a spot that's going to be above that spot where they would have met had they been level we're not level anymore with neither one of the the two forms on three a number four so let me show you that a little bit deeper so they would normally recede to and in, in rule number three let's stick here let me go in really further so you really get clear about rule number three so let's get in there deep okay I'll get my pen out so we can talk about a few things so let's take a look and really be mindful of what we're looking at so platform number one right there this platform right here that satisfies rule number one and rule, rule number two we have a vanishing point and it's on the horizon line this platform is level and look yes it's receding to a place a point on the horizon line all parallel lines will recede and then disappear this is also again right where our eye is locked on that level okay we're right there we can't take our eyes off of it so we're locked on right there however the platform changes now so what's going on is the platform is being raised up it's being tilted and lifted up the same way now that we raise and tilt you see the arrow I'll draw another one our vanishing point so all I did was to show that look at our side view is we take our flat platform number one it's illustrated here and we're showing that it's being turned up in perspective so it's coming at us a little bit so what happens is we moved our vanishing point up to here and what that does it raises our platform so the platform still touches the ground here right there right you see where it touches the ground there but now it's being raised up off of the surface so as we raise that vanishing point now it's off the horizon line it's even off our eye line correct yep it sure is now we have a new vanishing point we have a raised vanishing point for that platform rule number three is the perspective of the incline so we raise that and I'm going to write it down here rule number three let me make sure I go back to my pen it's the rule of the incline rule of the incline okay it's important to know so to get it nice terminology again I'll, I'll, I'll tell you again so all receding lines that are in nature or man-made as long as they're parallel to one another and if they incline upwards right they're going to eventually meet at that vanishing point again that got moved up the other vanishing point the natural one we have when things were level okay whoops wrong one when things were level okay stays on the ground here but because this is an incline 
we had to move it up. And the higher you move it up, what happens? You bet the more of an incline happens. So, for instance, if we come up back over here and I draw another form, so vanishing point out to there, vanishing point up here, if I had one up here, right, so this incline would be even higher. So, in another one could be here until we eventually get to what? A very flat, straight, up and down, 90 degree right platform. And there's no perspective to that anymore. Okay? So, that's what eventually could happen. So it's the perspective of the incline to which the degree that we had it sitting down on the ground, we raised that vanishing point up. These forms will now recede to a new incline vanishing point. And that's going to make a lot of sense not only if we move objects, but if we also move our head up and down. That's going to change to three-point perspective. So let's go on now to rule four. Rule number four is what? So if we had a perspective of the incline moving up, what do you think four would be? Four would be the perspective of the decline. So we'll put down here perspective of the decline right in through here. So let's take a look at this diagram, this illustration, see if we can learn a few things from it. Pull in really tight really close so you can see that all right so here we go so let's take a look at the side view first so what are we trying to say what are we trying to illustrate with our forms so we have our normalized level platform one right platform one here that's how they correspond platform two now goes into the earth here here, right here, on the decline. So it's being pushed down. It's like a little shaft or a platform to go in down into a basement or down into underneath the boat to go down into the water. So what do we do with the vanishing point? How do we get that? Well, now all the parallel lines that used to recede and disappear on the vanishing point on the horizon line have now been pushed downward to a new corresponding point. And when we find that point along that straight line, this line has to be straight down, and we stop. That's where the decline of our new form will be right there. So we're declining down in, and we're still receding to our new declined vanishing point, hence the rule of the decline, rule number four. So again, we brought that vanishing point on down to there. And of course, we now have a lowered vanishing point, but also a lowered platform as well, which is now platform number two. All right, so there are your four rules of perspective. And so I've tried to name them and make them a little bit easier to digest. Let's go back over them one more time and let's review. So we have them so you can commit them to memory so that you can use them anytime later on that you want. Okay, so what is rule number one? So rule number one is the rule of the VP, rule of the vanishing point, right? Number two, rule of the horizon line. So all parallel lines will recede to if they're level, will recede to, and parallel, will recede to one point, one singular point, and that points the vanishing point. Number two is the same thing, but they'll be, the VP will be on the horizon line. Important to know. Rule number three, we've got it right over here to the bottom left, is rule of the incline. And so if we need to make incline forms, we raise up that vanishing point to the degree that we need the platform to raise. And it's the vanishing point stays in the same spot, only moves vertical. It doesn't move left and right, but only moves vertical. That's the rule of the incline. And then rule number four is the same thing. It's just the decline. Rule of the decline, if we need to lower the form, we keep the vanishing point on the same spot, lower it down as far as we need visually. That becomes our new vanishing point, and the parallel lines will converge to that lowered vanishing point and become a declined 
in this case, a little platform. So roll the vanishing point, roll the horizon line, the vanishing point on the horizon line. Number three is the rule of the incline, and number four is the rule of the decline. So from now on, we can talk about rule number one. We know what we're talking about. Rule number two, we know what we're talking about. Rule number three, and we know what we're talking about. And, of course, rule number four. And the easiest way to remember is one is vanishing point, two is VP on the horizon line. Number three, incline, raised up vanishing point. And number four is decline, lowered vanishing point. So there you go. There are your four rules of perspective. Okay, let's keep on trucking through. We'll go to the next one. All right, welcome to the next plate. Take a look. Rule number one and rule number two are visible right here. What do they signify now? What are we illustrating now? Two point. Two point perspective. Two point perspective meaning that we have two vanishing points that are located on the horizon line and these forms are receding smaller to and disappearing to one singular point which is located on a horizon line. I better label that. And so we can, we've already demonstrated that rule and this is not a rule, this is just a demonstrative demonstration of how to pry this rule further. What do you notice about the direction of each plane? Let's take the top one, the right moving plane. Why do I call it, why do I call the blue one the right moving plane? Well, because see its length, see how it's a longer length than the right? We can say that that gives us kind of a flow in direction that these arrows show back to the VP, or we could call it, sometimes you'll see me label it in the future, the RVP or the right vanishing point right there. So that's important. It's not the RVR, right? It's the RV, whoops, let me erase this out. The RVP, right vanishing point. I just labeled it VP because it corresponds to rule number one, right? Which is what? Rule one and rule two. Rule one is the VP, rule one is the horizon line, and the VP is on the horizon line, okay? Same thing. Now, what about our bottom moving two-point form? That moves back to the majority of the flow is back to the left, right? You see that. You can see that by the length of this form here, right, in here, it feels like it's, we put jet engines on the back of it, right, flowing through. It feels like it's moving to the left, and that's the, by design because of the length is slimmer. All receding parallel lines are moving towards in this case, that vanishing point, and they're diminishing, and they'll disappear on the VP, and the VP is also on the horizon line. Now, well, of course, we can go this way, too, because we have two sets of vanishing points, which give us a look, if I was to make this into a form, which would look a lot like this, okay? So we have a sketched out rectangular kind of cube. It's a two-point cube where rule number one and rule number two apply to our perspective understanding. So it shows up very clearly in two-point perspective. All right, let's go on to the next illustration. Welcome back to plate number 13. Congratulations, you've got 12 plates under your belt. All right, so we've got the four rules of perspective nailed down. Rule number one, vanishing point. Rule number two, VP on the horizon line. Rule number three, the incline. Rule number Quattro, rule number four, right, is the decline. Now, we've got four new things we need to remember. How we see. Everything we've been talking about thus far is how we look and what we see. Now, imagine with me. You and I are together now. We're molded into one vision, as weird as that sounds, right? I get it. But we're all looking out through the same picture plane, okay? All right, so this whole white space out here is called the PPL, the picture plane. That's the entire surface that we're composing on, and it's infinite, meaning it goes on in many directions, left, excuse me, right, left, up, and down, in all other directions in between. It is infinite and goes on forever. As far as we can understand and see, that's our picture plane. We can also use it to draw on. There's our picture plane. Now we're looking out into the picture plane world 
and we've located number one, which is our center of vision, and number two, which is our eye level. And then where they meet is what we call the center point. All right, so let's talk, stop a moment and take a look at what we're seeing from this very complex, meticulously drawn drawing, right? It's pretty simple, and it's meant to be that way. What we're looking at is a kind of sight line for our vision. We all have this. This is all f part of our fundamental four that we carry around with this at all times. You were born with this innately. You carry it around. Animals carry it around. Any animal that sees the way we do, human or otherwise, you crazy animals out there, we all see alike. That means that if I draw a little head here, okay, here's a little head comes out, there's a neck and through here, here we go through here, here's our eye, here's our eye, here's our nose, here's our mouth, ear of course, right there, that's our center of vision, that's where our center line and our eye line, of course eye line's right on through, it starts to work right for us, okay? So let's talk a little bit further about that. We all carry around our center of vision, what splits right down the middle of our vision. So right over here is our center of vision. That splits us right down the middle, okay? Then we have our eye level, and it splits right down the middle of our all of our, our eyes, our left eye, our right eye, and then our most important center of vision, that center eye that we mythologically have that makes our vision monocular. And the reason why we do that is this. If like, if you're like me and you need glasses now, when I was younger I didn't, but now I do. And those of you that are older, if you have bifocals, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of your eyes are a little bit stronger, some are a little bit weaker, and that changes your vision a little bit. We're all going to assume now we're 20-20 vision, but with only one eye, right in the middle of both of our eyes. Okay, So that's important to realize. That's called our center of vision line and our eye line our eye level line and where they meet up center of vision and eye line or eye level you'll hear me call both of those that's our center point right there that's the true centrist point of our vision so we carry around these two every day our center of vision and our eye level you can't get away from it it's like that little crossing T or X it looks just like that you can see it through a telescope or a gun I like to think of it more as a telescope rather than a weapon right through there and we can see everything out of that vision things that are in the middle things that come out a little bit and the further they go out the harder it is for us to see them but that's our center of vision and our eye level commit this to memory these are two of the four fundamentals of what I call the four funds the fun pack four fundamentals of seeing center of vision and eye level all right, let's go on to the next play. All right, play number 14. So you already know in our four fundamentals what number one is. So our center of vision is up here. Okay, there's a lot of information on this screen, and we're going to simplify this and demonstrate why it's important and how you carry it around with you. You can't get away from it. So the moment that you open your eyes in the morning, to the moment that you close your eyes when you get rest and sleep, you carry this around with you. It's your fundamental four-pack. Center of vision is number one. You know that eye level over here, right, is number two. That's where our eyes are glued to ourselves. We can't get away from it. So I draw a little, little, little figure over here with a nose and another eye over here looking out, looking over, right, looking down. Looks kind of angry. There we go. And that's, our, that's our, our eye line. We are connected. Our eyes are connected to that. Okay. Now, we are all the same person, and we're looking out to through our center of vision and our eye line. Okay. So that's one self of us. We have another self, and we've talked about that earlier. This out here, out into the world, all out here, this is our 3D self. These arrows describe our three-dimensional self. But we can make a two-dimensional self if we pretend like from this center dot or center point here, right, we have a string that is attached to our eye. 
and it is moving all the way from our center eye to that center point on the van on the vanishing point right on the on the horizon line which is also here for now that is a distance line it tells us how far we are from that point to the center of our forehead where our eye is okay now if we flap it down think of it in terms of a flap if we flap ourselves down flap it on down and bring ourselves into the ground here right here this little person down here he or she depending on your gender that's our new self at a certain distance away I don't know what that distance is because I haven't given a measurement it could be 10 feet it could be a thousand feet depending upon uh, the scale we want to set or maybe even the size of objects that we choose to draw or we don't draw so that's your station point that point right between your eye the third eye right between your eyes located on your nose to give you that center monocular vision for this little guy over here it's right in the center point right in through there so what are our four fundamentals that we carry around with us that we'll always talk about well we know three one is our center of vision right down the middle right this next one is eye line that makes our telescope telescopic looking vision so we have that eye line or eye level I'll say both of those number three is station point okay that's where we are located on any given viewpoint we have to have some kind of relatable distance when we look out into this circle into this red and blue when we look out here out here and out here we're in the 3d, 3D land when we flap it down down towards our little figure that we're looking on top of in the ground that's our two-dimensional self that we can use for measuring and abstracting to make our 3d self real so that's one two and three now let's add the last four or the fourth attribute to our four fundamentals of our innate vision and what we're what we're given and born with and that's our cone of vision right in through here so this whole thing out here let me make it more clear is our cone of vision you carry around a cone of vision with you lucky you lucky me right we've got it our cone of vision what that means is it was determined and I've never been able to from any of my prior professors Gary Meyer who was who taught me at Art Center College of Design and anywhere I've researched um, nobody's really told me who came up with the standard of saying to us that 60 degrees from our station point outwards from our station point to make our cone is our cone of vision well it's 60 degrees and that's what we have agreed upon as artists and designers now let me pull in just a little bit and let me raise this up a little bit and get this idea really clear to you so we'll raise it up a little bit so we can see our station point it's our cone of vision so what that means is is that coming out of our station point down here and this is where we need our little 2d guy to help us with our cone of vision coming out of here at our station point a little dot here right here and over here this is a total of 60 degrees and we need it to hit our horizon line so that we can get use our circle here like a compass to make a 60 degree circle cone this thing looks like a cone from three-quarter view and so these blue marks number one represent and number two represent half of that just 30 degrees so 30 degrees on one side 30 degrees on the other side section one section two they make a total of a 60 degree cone that's our cone of vision okay so you might ask me okay mark that's our fourth fundamental of vision but who cares so what why is that important why do I need to know that well here's why and here's why people sometimes get a little frustrated with perspective it's this is this idea let me get my pen back there we go it is that less distortion take a look at these arrows less distortion happens inside our 60 degree or sometimes even a smaller cone a 30 degree cone and how we see so when we look at the world excuse me when we look at the world we look through this cone and relatively anything that's going on 
visually in our 60 degree cone is going to have less distortion. Anything that, any object or being, building, deer, book, basketball, shoe, soccer field, you name it, anything outside of our cone of vision, so you see I'm drawing these arrows, I got a lot, we're going to get more distortion that way. That's a lot of distortion we're going to get. And the further outside the cone, the more distortion that we get. Now that's pretty wild. We can't see the distortion in real life, in 3D. And that's a true shame because the distortion can be pretty wild and pretty interesting. Now here's the kicker. When we draw, we can draw outside of the cone of vision and we can see that distortion. So I'm going to take the layer off. That's a lot of mumbo jumbo out there so we can clean this up and I'll come back to it in a moment. So when we draw, we can draw either in the cone or out of the cone. The further out the cone that we get, we get more distortion. All right. We, sometimes we can see it peripherally in our vision, but a lot of times we can't. Things fold underneath, verticals get more angled, other left and right angles get more distorted, and there's a lot of degree of crazy distortion out here that exists in our visual mind, but we can't see it. Okay, so the next question is, you're probably wondering, is why? Why can't we see it? Why can't we just turn our head really quickly and see the distortion. If we can draw it on the paper, if we can draw in the cone, right, and then we can draw out of the cone, right, what happens if we can do that and see it, even though it gets more distorted, it gets even more distorted as we get further and further away from the cone. Look at that distortion that's happening. I know how to draw the distortion because I know perspective, right? Why can't we see it in real life? What's the deal? Well, here's the deal. Every time that you look at a different view, whether it's just a couple of angles up, down, left, or right, or move your eyes up just a little bit from where you had your fundamental force set up, you change your vision. Distortion goes away. So if we were looking straight right here, okay, and then we knew in our mind that there was a lot of distortion way outside our eyes over here. We cannot change our head really quickly and then turn our head over here. I'll draw a little, little profile guy. That's a bad profile guy, but you get the idea. He's looking over here, and we can't see the distortion. Why? Because our whole fundamental four switches. It resets. It resets back to a new vision. It would reset back to that to a clean vision without distortion. I'll make this more tangible for you the further that we go along. But it's really a fascinating idea that we can draw distortion when it's outside the cone, right? We can draw the distortion, but we can't truly see it in nature because our mind and our fundamental four reset. And because they reset, we can never see the distortions, which is truly truly kind of sad. I would have liked to see it, but that might give us all the brain freeze and a headache. We might all pass out for a while. Fisheye lenses, concave and convex type lenses, wide angle lenses at times can give us some of that distortion that we notice in that we see. If you ever, you know, maybe one time we'll do perspective drawing, but if you ever do perspective drawings in two point and you get further, further out, out to the left or to the right of your vanishing points where they go way outside, forms tend to go inside out of one another and you get tons of distortion and it's hard to keep up with it sometimes. It's like it's molding and folding un, un into itself. We can never see that in nature that I know of because our fundamental four continue to reset. So let's step back for a moment and let's review before we move on and what our fundamental four truly are and why they, and why they reset, okay? So the reason why now is you have a reset of your vision constantly. You constantly reset your center of vision, which is our number one up here. You constantly reset your eye line, right? 
you constantly reset when you do that your station point changes the distance might change a little bit and you constantly change you would change your cone of vision and we do it so fast the change is so fast we can't see the distortion we can't go ahead of the distortion so the reason why people I think have problems with perspective drawing sometimes is that we show some distortion when we when we draw we might show an object for instance maybe out here a little bit and they don't like how it gets a little distorted I don't mind that at times as long as it doesn't get too out of control for my idea of what I want to draw otherwise it doesn't bother me some people think it looks arbitrary and it looks stiff and I will say you're not using perspective um, properly enough or in a way that you're letting the distortion uh, overtake your drawing. Remember, creativity always, always over the technical. Creativity first, the technical is always subordinate to that. Okay? So there you go. There's your four fundamentals. Eye line, number two, actually number one, center of vision. Eye lines, number two. And, of course, you know that station point or distance, that point right between our eyes, our third eye, if you will, and then our cone of vision, that 60-degree cone, that standard agreed-upon dimension, that conic, circular, conic, funnel-like tool that we have to control distortion and more distortion when you get outside of it. We'll talk about the four fundamentals always in perspective and of course with our four rules of perspective so now with these plates after finishing plate 14 you now understand the four rules of perspective which is the rule of the VP the rule of the horizon line and the VP on the horizon line the rule of the incline the rule of the decline and now with your four innate four fundamentals or your fun four which is center of vision eye level station point and cone of vision. All right, let's move on to plane 15. We're going and cut. Okay, plate number 15. Okay, layer. Okay, view. Okay, so recording in five, four, three, two. Okay, next plate. So what we're illustrating in this particular plate is all of it together that we just talked about. Your fundamental four, but now we've got a view of Darth Vader and we're looking down on him from about three quarters and we're trying to understand all these concepts that we're talking about in an illustration looking down on this person from a distance so we can see it all in action that's what these next plates are about so we can see all this together so you can understand it not only how you see it but how somebody else these projection these projections go on in our vision even though we don't see them so let's hash out everything that we see so we see Darth Vader here he's got his lightsaber there and he's he's looking at Obi-Wan Kenobi on the other side of the picture plane. The picture plane then is parallel to us, upright and infinite in all directions, left, right, top, and bottom, and whatever diagonals you want to think about. It is infinite in all directions. We just show a slice of it here so we can make the diagram work for us. Okay. The horizon line is located now. We see his vision. It's also located on his eye line, which is our second fundamental, correct, of our four fun fundamentals. The eye line is located out on the horizon line. It is at the same level as the eye line and also now the station point. So station point attribute number three comes out of his center of vision there, comes out of the center of the forehead in between the eyes, and we see it at this, and manifest 
at the center point in our composition. So fundamental number one, two, three, and four. And now let's find our cone. Number four, our cone of vision. Remember, 60 degrees coming out of his forehead. 60 here and 60 here. Half of that's 30, right? 30 and 30. There's the cone in the three-quarter view. The distance coming out, distance lying in through here in this whole entire thing, circular, but also the outward funnel right in through here is the cone of vision of Darth Vader. His best vision is within this cone. There's less distortion within this cone, and there's greater distortion the moment that his peripheral vision gets us out of that. We can't see much outside of that anyway. Our vision is so limited. limited. It's really more of about a 30 degree cone or so, 25 to 30 degree cone. But we have a 60 degree cone that's, that's standard and that we talk about um, in perspective. And so it's pretty limited. So there he is standing upright with his center of vision visible, his eye line we can see, the station point, it's the distance between his eye and to the center point, and then downwards gives us where he's standing to. If he's six foot five, then that's maybe about six foot tall where his station point is, six feet tall. It's not the top of your head. It is where your third eye, your center eye is inside your head too as well. Now let's find our other station point, U as well. This is the U2, or this, the 2D, two-dimensional U. It's from the center point, and we have flapped it down. Darth, Darth has come, we've flapped him down. It's the same distance now all the way into the ground. The two-dimensional station point, I could put a little head here for a person looking back up to the horizon line. We call that this distance, this area, a distance line. We can mark it off in different widths, and we can have measurement along that surface. We have a ground line here that we could do measurement on. Later on, if we wanted to draw objects, we can do measurements on a ground line that we designate to and from us, from our station point, to give us a better idea of how wide or how large something is at our distance line. So there's a lot of technical understanding that we can learn from in this particular uh, illustration to show you that not only we see our four fundamentals, we also see our picture plane. We can now understand our three-dimensional and two-dimensional self by our station points, and we can understand how we can start to measure objects and get a true accurate three-dimensional look by using our two-dimensional projection, which is our station point down below. Let's take a look at the other side and see what Darth Vader is looking at. So in this plate, we're looking at the other side of where Darth Vader was looking. Now we're looking at Obi-Wan in his silhouette here. And so we're looking at essentially the same type of illustration, but now we're on the other side of their... If you can imagine it, their picture playing like a piece of plexiglass that separates the two, and there are, there's some distance from one another looking out. They're ready to engage in a battle. And so let's find out what Obi-Wan and how what he's seeing. So we see the picture plane, which is demarcated here, this rectangle around the entire drawing, or this area. And remember, it can be infinite. It goes out in all directions, infinitely out into into space. That's our picture plane, okay, that, that area. Let's find the center of vision. So our center of vision, if we can locate it from his station point all the way out to our center point, we draw a straight line through there. We found his center of vision, which is also can be part of the distance line down to the station point. What about the eye line or eye level? So from the point of his eye, center of his eye downward, Right through here, there's where we find our eye line coming straight across, which is also, since his eye and his view is connected, it stays on the horizon line. This is also becomes our horizon line. So the eye line and the horizon line can stay connected to one another and become both. Later on, I'll show you in three-point, I'll show you a quick demo of a draw, our drawings, actually, where the eye line and the horizon line come off of one another, and that gives us three-point perspective. So lastly, our station point right and our cone of vision. 
Our station point is between our eye. You see it right here, and you see it right down here. Remember, it's flapped over. So these lines show where that flap is occurring, where we wind up down here, and there's our other self down below here our two-dimensional self, so we can give ourselves measurement across the ground line, right, which is perpendicular to us through here, horizontal line, so we can measure on that ground line, or it can be called a measuring line, it can be called both, and of course, number four, we you see our cone of vision out into reality here. Here's where the less amount of distortion happens, and that's 60 degrees from our cone of vision. We have it visually out in reality and we also have it on our two-dimensional surface too as well. It could come down to our 2D station point just like that 30 degree cone. Remember more distortion happens where? Outside the cone less distortion happens inside the cone. So that's our view now of the attributes of vision that we're looking on is we're kind of behind Obi-Wan a little bit higher looking down seeing all the technical applications of what we're just being talked about come alive and manifest when we see and also we can understand that and quantify that now uh, when we're drawing as well. Let's go on to the next. Now with plate 17 now we're going to illustrate ideas about picture plane in our fundamental four, and we're going to look at our heroes, right? The resistance and what they're seeing, and it's illustrated with the red lines. Okay, we have Lei at the top, we have C3PO at the top right, Yoda down at the bottom left, and then Chewbacca down at the bottom right. So, what do you notice first off, besides the diagrams in front, the red line, four different visual points of view of our resistance heroes looking out into reality. So what I want to do now is bump up and go to Leia first. So let's bump her up a little bit, bring her in, and let's label and talk about what we look like. This could represent you. She can look right back at us, and this could be your vision as well. We all carry this around, and the point of these illustrations is to etch it into your mind clearly, succinctly, without any doubt as to how we see and why and what we're seeing in relationship to perspective. So the first thing we notice about this diagram is here's our picture plane. Here's our P, our PPL. Remember that's infinite in all directions. We can move this out diagonally, we can move it out horizontally and also vertically. I think you get that. That can continue to come outward. Okay, so what do we notice? We notice that here's our center Here's her center line right here. Here's her center point right through there, which is also her station point. Both of them, because it comes right at us. Her third eye, her station point eye, is right there, right? So we use that third eye for vision. We use monocular vision to give us the cleanest, clearest, most accurate vision, okay? All right, what about this line? Here's our eye line. Right to high line, eye line, or eye level right there. In this view, this would also take care of her horizon line right there. Not every view will do that. She could be in one point perspective right in through here. All right, so we have one center of vision, right? Two, her eye line, which is also her rise line, and, uh, horizon line in this case. Number three, her station point right through there. What about the cone of vision? It's right here. Here's her cone of vision at what I'm calling 60 degrees manifest out. So anything that she sees through that 60 degree cone out through here, right, inside, will have much less distortion. Anything that she comes, she gets outside of that is going to give more distortion to her vision. So we have, and if we flip that, that's actually what we're looking through as well. It could be ours looking at her and it could be her looking at ours. In our case I'm imagining it with you to be hers looking out at the broader world. Alright let's go to the right and let's take on our droid friend C3PO and his vision. Alright so here we are we see him in direct profile. We see Leia, we saw Leia in full frontal vision. So in profile we see much less of 
that picture plane than what Princess Leia did. So let's analyze what he's seeing to get this thoroughly ingrained in us. So his picture plane is here. We see it infinitely go out this way and go up, up this way, but it's coming right at us. Okay, it's coming at us and it's also going away. We can't because it's so we can't see it because it's so directly in front of us we can't see the left or the right. Okay. So let's talk about his center of vision. It can only be relatable really as a straight line in the back. So right in through here would be his number one, his center of vision, his C V, right? There we there we go. Number two would be his eye line right here going across I can't even show it by that line because that would be in perspective it's right there coming right at us that's number two and that's his eye line right in through there station point his station point right here between his other two eyes right there is his station point now his secondary self goes down that same distance down into the ground and becomes his second uh, well, it should be actually curved. That is his secondary station point. So station point, that's number three, right through there. And number four, we can see still pretty clearly, but see how we see the center, the cone of vision now in a very cone-like way because we're truly from its side view. So it becomes a cone. 30 degrees and 30 degrees, 60 degrees. So in this case, there's 30 there's 30, which makes a total of 60 degrees. So we can now see outside of C3PO visually and see his attributes, his four fundamentals that he's using to create or see vision. So let's pull out a little bit further and let's take on our two more cast of characters and find out what they're looking at. These are a little bit different, a little bit more challenging. Notice that Yoda now is looking up somewhat. So he's going to be off the horizon line. So he's going to be in three-point perspective. So now we can go, e go deeper into and look at the diagram that he's projecting, he has in his mind, and let's analyze this a little bit uh, further. So we have our picture plane here. So our PPL here, here's our picture plane right there. Remember, that's infinite, out in all directions. It's worth repeating this several times until it becomes secondary nature. So we have that. Okay, number one, center of vision, right here. Here's our number one, our center of vision there, straight down, straight through his head, right in through there, but projected outwards. That's our center of vision. Number two, eye line. Eye line's right here. Here's his eye line here. Here's his eye line here. I'll labor at EL. His, the horizon line, because Yoda is looking up, the horizon line stays where it's at, and it's lower. It's probably somewhere, can be, maybe I'm going to guess, it's somewhere down here. Here's his horizon. I'm going to label it EL, and it's probably somewhere down there. So it's moved off of the horizon line by oh, I don't, let's say, 20 degrees maybe or so. So that puts him in three-point perspective. Here's his center point. And then lastly, no, in addition to, we have our station point here. Number three, that eye in between the other two eyes in his forehead, right? And then we have what? Number four, right, our cone. Here's our cone of vision right through here, okay? We have 30 degrees. 30 degrees, which makes a total of 60 degrees across. And of course, there's less distortion on the inside and more distortion as we get outside that cone. Okay, so let's move on now, lastly, to our furry friend Chewbacca, and let's see what he's got going. So he's got a nice head tilt, and he's off the horizon line, so he's in three-point perspective, too. So let's raise, magnify him in. Let's bring him in a little bit. And let's talk about what we're seeing with Chewbacca. Okay, so let's identify our four fundamentals. Let's go a little bit faster. So number one, here's our center of vision. Number two, here's our eye line right through here. 
the horizon line is going to be lower. It's probably somewhere even further down, right in through here, which puts them in three-point perspective. So we have number one. We have number two. His station point is right there, number three, station point. Okay. And then we have his cone. Cone comes out here to there. We see it. We can barely see the degree, but we know this is 30 degrees here across from here to here, okay? And another 30 degrees on the other side, 30 and 30, which gives us a total of a 60 degree cone all the way across. We'll get less distortion here and more distortion on the outside of our drawing. Also, remember our picture plane. Here's this picture plane right in through here, and of course that's infinite in all directions. Really important to memor to realize everything generally becomes a picture plane. So we've got some distinctly different views from our cast of characters here. Let's pull back out and then let's center this a little bit and, to and wrap this part of it up. So we looked at again, we projected and made manifest their visual fundamental four that each one of them has just like us. So a droid can have it too where we're going to see that telescopic center of vision with our eye line, and then we know we have a station point from the center of our eye coming out to the vanishing point as a distance line, and then we have our 60-degree cone that projects outward that we can see the, the observable world that we lock in our vision that gives us either great clarity in the, or as we get further and further outside that cone gives more distortion and then each time they move, each time these figures move from front here, so I'll label that. So this is front. Whoops, I almost slid that across. I caught myself. Ha, ha, ha. Didn't do it this time. Okay, so this is front here. When they switch over to profile, if Leia looked over at C3PO, her total vision re re it resets. It changes it would look a lot like C-3PO. So, so if Yoda looked down at, at um, Chewbacca, what we could call his vision, kind of three-quarter looking up, and we'll call Chewbacca's three-quarter looking up and uh, two as well. So three-quarter uh, looking, looking up two as well. Every time they change their view, they've got, we've got four different views here. If they, if they took each other's view, their complete set of fundamentals change and they reset completely. Everything resets. So if you're taking a photograph or you're making a video, if you hold the camera still, there's no reset. It's all the same. Things can come in, things can come out. Your center point, your center of vision, your eye line, all that stays the same. But we can move in and out as human beings and you can change the camera but it's constantly resetting but the center of vision and the center point don't change when drawing and painting we can even cut into frames too which is gets pretty exciting okay let's go on to plate number 18 all right we were have arrived now at plate 18 okay so let's analyze and take a look and see what's in front of us so there should be a lot of things that uh, you now recognize here uh, in front of us. I think we can all recognize now the our four fundamentals, right, which is our center line, or center of vision, excuse me, center of vision, uh, I, our eye level here, right, which is also now connected to our eye level, so our eyes are connected to right on the horizon line. So our eye line and horizon line are synonymous of the same. Our station point is down here below, okay, way down here you can see it. That's you as well, that's your little station point there, that's you flapped up or flapped down if you will, right from here coming right out of your your forehead to here, right? So your station point's down there, that's number three, and then of course number four is your cone of vision here. And here's our 60 degree cone from our, out from our station point, 30 degrees out from each uh, equal part here from the center to get it 60 degrees across and then I just drew that with a compass well I'll show you that later on when we get into manually demonstrating and going through our illustrations and our lectures but this is a 60 degree cone okay and remember that inside the cone there's much less distortion much more much greater distortion obviously again outside of the cone now let's get into more particulars here about what we're looking at so 
down below here we're looking at I've got labeled here we're looking at a one point perspective drawing of three different rectangular boxy cube like structures in accurate one point perspective how we would see it from our vision it's also inside the cone right so there's much less distortion okay much less distortion here as well so really there isn't a whole lot uh, of distortion at all to look at now what we're seeing beyond that are three different points of view in our viewpoint onto our particular vision out out here in in this reality that we're looking at number one is a this box is on the ground plane sitting down right here touching the ground right here. It's also the closest box to us. Remember that? That any of the objects that are lo the lowest on the picture plane will be the closest to us. Anything higher then will be the furthest away. And in this composition we'll assume that box C is the furthest away right now. It's really high because it's even off the ground plane. So our point of view is this. We're looking now on to Let's pull in a little closer here. We're looking now on, to, on three boxes, and we have different points of view of these three boxes simultaneously. Number one is A. A is below our eye level. Okay, so remember, our eye level is here. We're locked in. Here's our eye here. We're looking over at our composition, right, looking out. That's just a representation because our eyes are locked on that. We're looking in the composition, actually, here. Make sure that I don't mess that up for you right now we see the front plane of our one point box which is parallel to us there's no perspective there so this front plane of box a here is nice and completely parallel to us right or we see that i think you understand that we get that now because the vanishing point is in our center of vision this box is pushed over from that center of vision a little bit to the left well how do we know that well we see the right side of this box so if we were sketching this box etc this is and if it was obviously located below our eye level and a little bit to the right this is how we would draw that notice the diminishment back to that vanishing point or one single point remember rule number one's in play and then rule number two is in play because the point is connected onto the horizon line especially since it's level and our head is not moving up and down so we see the front plane is being parallel we see the side plane the right side plane being diminished diminishing back to the vanishing point and we also see now the top plane why? Because it is below our eye level. So it's sitting down on the ground somewhat slightly below our eye level. And here's our eye level. And, of course, we see that it's below. So you can see how perspective begins to work now as I pull out a little bit in that these boxes can be related to your normal regular vision, which is what we're really replicating here. We're just pulling in the cone a little bit. Now, in terms of my composition, my picture plane, the closer or the excuse me, the further away we bring out our station point, the farther away or larger our cone can get. And the closer our station point pulls in, the smaller that 60 degree will cone can get on your picture plane. So something to keep in mind if you're having trouble drawing and composing later on. I'll show you techniques for that. But you're getting more distortion than you want. You're still outside or probably far outside uh, the cone from where you want to be. Now object number two is at eye level. So if you look down here we've just located the one on the ground plane here. Now let's take a look at the next object, and that is the object B here. Let me get my pen back on or right at eye level. What does that mean? Well, when looking at this object and knowing where our eye level is, which is also the horizon line, which is right here, this box cannot be seen from our viewpoint. We cannot see a top or a bottom if it's opaque. Now I've drawn these transparent, six-sided as we look through them like they're, they're made out of glass. Sure we can see under the top and over the bottom, right? But if it's opaque we cannot see the top 
and we cannot see the bottom. And that's important because it's in our relative eye level. So this box can be moved up a little bit. It can be moved down a little bit. As long as the top or the bottom is not shown together simultaneously, we understand then it's in our relative eye level, hovering there a little bit. And that's very different from our bottom box. Why? Because we can see the top. So point of view, POV, really matters. In, you, in the observable world where you see, you won't see a top or a bottom, you, uh, or you do see a bottom, or you do see a top, and you'll draw it, you'll understand better structurally how to get those particular angles to work for you. And this is why we take great pains to study perspective, not because we were masochists or sadomasochists and we love personal torture or torture of others. We, we understand that perspective is the key to structural integrity in your drawing, in your practice of visualizing forms and space and doing anything you want with them representationally, semi-representationally, and then on into abstraction, uh, representational kind of geometric abstraction or even organic. Um, there's a place still for perspective and then blowing up the rules too as well. But I want you to, all of my students at NKU and beyond to in YouTube land, wherever, to really understand the rules in a top-notch kind of way. Again, rule number one and rule number two apply to our eye level box, box number B, or box B, going back to a point in this point, and again also is on the horizon line. Very important. All right, so let's pull out one more time and let's take a look at our, our uh, diagram, our illustration number 18. Our last one we want to look at in one point is box C, and that is in the sky plan. You can imagine it coming towards us, or you can imagine these boxes going away from us as if we've thrown them, or you can imagine them stationary. The only issue with, with box C is how far away is it, or how close away is it to us. And the only way we'd be able to tell is if I drew a, a vertical line down and said, okay, I want it to fall maybe right here. If you can follow along with me right in through here. So that would be the front part of the box. If I did that, and I brought this down vertically here and here and went back to the vanishing point. Now we could say, okay, of all these boxes, which are the closest boxes? Well, A would be the closest. It's the lowest. Here's where it touches the ground. B would touch the ground or is touching the ground right there. And if C were lowered to the ground plane, it would touch the ground right here. So it would be further pushed back. Now, I could adjust this line if I brought this down even lower to make it in front of all of the boxes, but I don't want to. I want to push it back. So there is some ambiguity about a floating box, at least right now, but that's the way I, you can quantify that very quickly about its size is to pull it forward or back depending upon, in this case, just bring, bringing a vertical construction line and telling yourself, drawing very lightly, where you want it to fall in composition. Now, in terms of its point of view, what makes it interesting is that it's raised above our eye line in our vision. It's still in the cone, so it's not very distorted. This is actually how we would see it. And see how it moves back to, again, rule number one, rule number two, it moves back to the vanishing point, and the vanishing point is on the horizon line. So all parallel lines in nature recede back to that point. Okay, we see parallel lines here, here, and here, and they recede back to a point. Now, again, all of these forms, the front plane is what? Parallel to us, there is no perspective in this form, right? So if I shoot it back to the vanishing point, I'll just do a quick sketch, bring down, bring down. There's your perspective on the bottom and the left, in this case, the left side, because I push it over to the right a little bit. Also, what's interesting about this, this box is we don't see a left side or a right side because it's so close, what, to our center of vision. So it's just like this box, box B, when it's in eye level, it hovers. We don't see a top or bottom. Here we don't see a left side or a right side. Now we can see inside of it, right, because I made it transparent. But if it's opaque, if it's completely uh, opaque, blacked out or whited out, we couldn't see it. Now we see a bottom plane very, very cleanly right here. I'll label it bottom. 
and we see that bottom distinctly because I, you understand why now it's raised above our eye level. This is very important to understand, not only in drawing from observation how to adjust angles when you're not using such formal perspective, which is the point. It's the point is to make it more relaxed and more sketchy, but understand the structure. Okay? Um, how do you get these angles? How would we know where a vanishing point is if I eliminated the vanishing point in our viewpoint? Well, we could follow these angles down and where they touch together, where they converge together into a single point, that would be your vanishing point. Really the same thing for all of these, all of these box forms. And then of course we're looking up to the vanishing, excuse me, the bottom plane. Why? Because it is below our eye level. Looking up to. Powerful stuff. Point of view is powerful in one point perspective. So if we back up again and review, back up and review a little bit, what we'll see now is a, is a perspective setup. You'll see this do this sometimes. Yeah, we'll establish our center line, our center of vision. We'll establish our eye line. We'll establish a station point of how far we want to be away. And remember, that represents the bottom station point, the two-dimensional U down here. That's 2D U. That also represents the 3D U, which is the view of everything out here. This is the 3D U out here, and it's represented down below at the station point as well. That way we can, from the 2D uh, station point, we can get our nice cone, which we have, which is our fundamental number four. So when we look out into this drawing and we see these, these three boxes and how they relate, this is what your 2D uh, station point is seeing as well, but it's dropped down lower in the horizon line, the eye line, the center of vision, all is flipped up vertical, if you can imagine that. So it's the same kind of thing. So we're very fortunate to have an abstract two-dimensional two, two uh, vision of ourselves and also a three-dimensional vision of ourselves. So this is one point, procedure of one point perspective, really follows nicely from rule one and rule two. Remember the rule of vanishing point, all receding lines in nature, if they're parallel or man-made in level, will recede to one point. And then uh, rule number two is that that point will be on the horizon line as well. Okay, so that's one point in perspective with a formal setup. Now, Take heart, we won't always have to do a big time formal setup with all our four fundamentals. You don't always have to do that. As a matter of fact, even in, in very technical linear perspective, you won't always have to do it, but it certainly helps, okay? All right, let's go on now to plate number 19. Plate number 19 shows the same kind of setup as plate number 18. You're gonna see that consistency in the next five or six kinds of plates. So we already know that uh, I think our, my center of uh, vision got cut off, so let's la relabel it back up here. CV, center, center, that was a terrible drawing, right? This pen sometimes at the top it gets a little funky. All right, so let's take that off. Let's do this a little properly. So number one, over here, our center of vision. Remember, it's our telescopic kind of line. Center of vision, right, and our eye line, number two. So number two is over here, our eye line, which is still... Uh, on the horizon line. So I'm going to draw an eye over here and remember we're still locked in to our horizon line. That won't be true later on. That can change. Okay. So number three is our station point. Our station point is way down here where we see our little person, uh, female or male. That's you down there. That's the two-dimensional version of you. And then of course uh, our cone of vision at 60 degrees coming out from our station point. So just remember this down below, right in through here at 60 degrees total as it widens out. That stays 60 degrees, right? Because the vision widens. And each side from the center of vision, uh, we use a 30 degree triangle angle to, to get our 30 degrees from the center center point out to here and from the center point out to the other side. I'll demonstrate how to do that later on. Remember this particular 25 slide lecture is to get you warmed up, to get you influenced in terms of vocabulary and terms 
and technique and, and a little bit of procedure here, but we'll go into that uh, wholeheartedly about um, slowing it down and showing the procedure a little bit further. So 30 degrees and 30 degrees equals a total of 60 degrees, and we have our total 60 degree cone. We have more distortion out here, and of course we have less inside the cone. So now what are we looking at? We're looking at three boxes in two-point perspective. Okay, so let's analyze what that means. Now, we have two vanishing points. We have a LVP over here, and we have an RVP, a left vanishing point, and a right vanishing point. And something, one thing you don't know is they're set up that they are on a right 90 degree angle from one another into the station point. So I'll just show you this really quickly. They come into the station point, us down below, and they come out of the station point, in and out, and they make a 90 degree angle right through there together. So everything that we draw then out here inside our cone has a natural 90 degree relationship. Any, any, any box or cube form, what makes it a cube, cube is, are 90 degree corners, right? And so all of these forms that we're seeing now in perspective, right, have a 90 degree corner. So I'll write that. And the way you get that is to set up your left and your right vanishing point at 90 degrees coming in and and out of the station point. We'll talk about how to set that up at a little bit later date. So let's just talk about more of what we're seeing. Now, as we look out into our drawing out here, all this space inside the cone, right, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, outside the cone, <coughs> excuse me there, uh, we are seeing what we see out here. Okay, now mine is all the, the diagrams and the little, little sketches, the scratches that I'm making. We're seeing the three boxes, box A, box B, and box C, as they naturally occur in space. And so much like the setup in the previous plate, we'll start with the box number A, which is in the ground plane. plane. So let me pull in just a little bit, and let's talk a little bit about what's going on there. What do you notice that's different from our one-point perspective? Well, Number one, we have two vanishing points, so we know that. So I'll put over here two. We have two VPs, right? And remember, they both follow rule numbers one, right, and two for both sets of planes. One's going back to the right at a single point, and yes, that single point is also on the horizon line. So that satisfies rule one and rule two, and that's, only the, that's the only two rules that we'll need, okay? We don't need the rule of incline and we don't need the rule of decline. The difference in the look of the view is stark, right? So we utilize in art history one point perspective for a good long while. And to my knowledge, the first person that used two point perspective was Albert Dewar. I'll write his name over here, D-U-R-E-R -E with two dots above the E, Albrecht Dewar. And it's a print of the study of St. Jerome at his, at his study or in his studied office. And it's got a little chair that's a two-point perspective. It's very subtle. The difference now in the look is this. From a two-point form here back to a one-point form here, notice that flat plane that has no perspective. It's parallel to us, perpendicular right. Here we are looking at it here, and it comes flat, flat across our surface like that and it goes back to a vanishing point and can look like that right it's kind of a box like that or it can look like this if you will right but it is a one point vision of the world and now we've moved on to a two point where we see this front corner right and then we have a left plane that diminishes then we have a right plane that diminishes same thing for the top and also the bottom. Now, in our point of view, what's going on? Well, box A is in the ground plane, so it touches the ground. It's closest to us right there. 
there's where it's closest to us. So it's touching the ground. It's touching the ground all over, but that's its closest point to us right there. Now, because we, it is below our eye level and the horizon line, which are one and the same right now, we see the top plane. Very important to understand. We see that top plane very cleanly. We do not see the bottom because it's touching completely the bottom of the ground, even though we can see all the way through it because we consider it to be transparent or glass. So box A, two-point perspective, it's slightly pushed over from our center of vision a little bit. So we see, possibly we can see, depending upon how you structure your box, it's just pushed over a little bit. It's, it's true center is a little bit to the left of center of vision. Okay. All right. So let's pull out a little bit. Let's take a look at what we've got. Now let's talk about box B. Box B is more eye level. How do we know that? Remember back from the prior plate, and we see box B now going a little bit further. Um, without a top in our vision, we know it has a top, truly, and we cannot see the bottom. Because remember, here's our eye line right in through here, which is also our eye level, right? Okay, so I'll draw a little eye so we can remember that. It's always good to refresh. <laughs> and because it hovers in our vision, we don't see the true top or bottom. Now, we're seeing through it transparency like it's glass, but again, we want to think of this, and the reason for this is to understand if it were opaque. Now, it can move up some. It can move down some. But as long as we don't see the top or the bottom, it's still in our eye level, even though it's still conforming to rule number one, rule number two, and also two point. The moment that it, what happens if we kept lowering this box in the moment that it broke the horizon line or our eye line and we could see just a little sliver, maybe something like, I'm talking just a tiny little sliver of the top of it, right? That would be what? That would be in more the ground plane and we would see that top. And so... Uh, we would actually see the top because it's slightly below our eye line. Same thing can happen with if we pushed it up just slightly up and through here. So that's important to know, not only drawing from imagination, but also, and probably even more importantly, is to draw from observation. And just let me say that all of this is set up for you to draw better from observation. Better structure, better vision, better craftsmanship, and when you align all three of them together, you get a stronger vision of uh, understanding and, and, and drawing, and that applies to the figure. Perspective applies not just to architecture or environments or spaceships or whatever it is that we're drawing, but to everything. The figure, uh, hands, feet, toes, fingers, uh, torsos, all of it, buttock region, legs, you name it. It all can be controlled better with perspective. Okay, let's go on to the last box, and that is box C, and that is in sky plane level. Also, remember, I'll draw it up here in the right corner. Remember, everything above the horizon line right now is sky. Sky plane and everything below is ground plane. That's, that's uh, something to remember. If I come over here and I draw a mountain scape in the very far background on the horizon line, all the mountains would be above, right? They would be above eye level in the, in just in the sky plane, just a little bit. They wouldn't be below, unless they're icebergs, maybe, and that they'd be floating in the water. That's a different story, but I think you get the idea. Okay, let's pull in now to box C, and let me go back and pull this down so we can see it. Now, remember from the last plate when we were, we were, we had some ambiguity how close it was to us. We can do that again. I'm going to still make it, I'm going to make it a middle distance in between these two boxes. How do I do that? Well, the easiest way is to tell ourselves, let's pull down a vertical here, and we're going to tell ourselves it's going to land on the ground right there. Now, we can see through this box, and that's a good thing. So I'm going to put a dot to where it lands through here. I'm going to draw this vertical down some. Of course, I'd have to be in two-point perspective going back. 
but I just want to show you that's where it's going to stand in its front tip where it's on the ground. It's all on the ground, that plane, but that's where its front tip is. This is where its front tip in the very back of box B is. So here's box A, here's box C, right? Here is box B, and which is the closest to us? If we ran into all these boxes, they were on the ground, we would hit box A first, then C second, and then B last, okay? Now let's go back up to C, and let's talk about why it's unique. I'll bring it down a little bit so we can see it just a little bit better. I hope you understand that. It's about when it's elevated like that and it's not on the ground, we can quantify where it's at by bringing, a, in this case, a vertical down and then going back to the vanishing point to find these angles again. Very simple referencing. And we've already seen some of that in other lessons. It's just a simple referencing technique. Okay, getting back to this box proper, box C, we can see up to the bottom. Our eye is lower. It's down here. We're seeing up to, and now we can see the bottom of this box very cleanly and very clearly. We cannot see the top. We cannot throw ourselves up there. We can't be in two, two places at the same time. So here we have the top, but we can't see the top if it's opaque. Now, we see the top plane on the inside because we're omniscient, we're omnipresent, and we can see inside the box. We can also see the right plane here in front. That's right front, but then also back here, right here and here. That's the right plane back. And then same thing with both the left planes and then the left plane in the very back. Here it is back there here as well. So I'll put left plane and then left plane back. And then, of course, we see the bottom. So we've drawn in all of these diagrams, which I've done so far, we've drawn all six sides. It's important to understand what all six sides are doing. You'll need that in perspective, but you'll also need that when you draw the figure. You, won't, you certainly won't always draw it out. But to understand where the spatial location of your forms are at both of all six sides intuitively speaking in the how do you get better intuitively well you draw perspective and that helps you you work with perspective until you know it really well and you can let go of some of all the technical mumbo jumbo well i won't call it mumbo jumbo but all the technical interest and then you just draw and sketch, but it, it tightens things up for you. Okay, so there's box A, box B, box C in two-point perspective in our vision, and it's important just to know that two-point perspective when, on, when level follows rule number one and rule number two of perspective, all, all parallel lines in nature, I mean, they're man-made, that they're level, they'll recede to a point, like a left vanishing point or a right vanishing point, and then that point will be, rule number two, will be on the horizon line. So very important to understand. Now we're going to engage rule number three and rule number four, and we're going to talk with the next plate, and we're going to talk about three-point perspective and what happens when we lower and or raise our head. I think that's interesting and challenging, and we didn't see that kind of more extreme perspective really happening in art until I think the late 19th and certainly 20th century, but especially the explosion of extreme points of view in video, film, well, film, video, animation, uh, comic books, etc. in the 20th century and exploded, and of course now on to, to our time in the 21st century. So, all right, so there you go as a quick introduction to some two-point two point views and why two points important as well. Okay, let's go on to, shall we, to the next slide. Hey, you're almost there. We're at slide 20, about five slides left. Take a deep breath. You're almost there. Uh, go, go grab a beer or go, go, go relax for a moment. You're getting closer, but now I think it should get even more, hopefully more exciting to you, uh, if not certainly more complex uh, with slide number 20. Now what we're looking at in all this mumbo jumbo and all this technicality is a three-point perspective view of a box-like form uh, looking from bird's eye view. Woo, what is all that? 
mean? Well, let's talk about where our setup is first still. And I got to go back up here. I think this got cut off in the scan. Way up here is our center of vision, number one, CV for center of vision. We know what that, what that is, okay? Now, something's getting funky with number two. Here's our eye line right over here, right? But wait a minute. Where's our horizon line? Our horizon line is way back up here. There was the old center point right there. Here's the new one right here for us. Remember, where the center of vision and eye line come together, that's the center point right there where I made it a little bit darker. Take a look over here. The eyes are tilted downward. So we are above this box, and we're tilting down looking at it. So it's not a two-point box anymore. It's three-point. We have three vanishing points to tackle. So number three now is our what we call our station point, but it's moved over, you notice. We could bring it over here, but it gives room for this vanishing point over here I'll talk about in just a moment. Number three is our station point, but we've added a V. It's called our vertical station point. And it is where we are flapped over now to the right. Now, when we look at you and I mold together, we all mold together and we're looking at the box and our entire composition, all of this out here, right? All of this out here and inside the cone, all of the, all the entire picture plane. This is what we're seeing of our three-dimensional vision itself, but it's also represented as it's flapped down and over two-dimensionally back to our vertical station point there. It's flapped over. We just have it flapped over to the right. And we still have a 60-degree cone coming from our station point, which is the, our third eye right in the middle of, our, of our, our head there between our two eyes. And that makes a 60-degree cone. It's marked on our center of vision. And of course, we draw with a compass that cone. So inside there, Believe it or not, there's much less distortion, and then it's still, again, outside the cone, there's still greater distortion. In the three-point perspective, the further you get outside quickly, it gets really, really distorted, okay? Now, we have a three-point setup from bird's eye. That means, again, our head is tilted downward, and this is probably about 25 degrees. So if you kind of look over here, I'll draw a little, I'll draw a little head here and this head is tilted downward now this way this is what's happening so here's his eye nose in through here and we're looking down about 30 degrees onto a topic in this case a box a real simple box okay like so our head is not straight anymore it's tilted downward what that means is is that we still have a true rule number one and rule number two, okay? We have a left vanishing point and a right vanishing point. And now we have a vertical vanishing point, which is still rule number one. But we now we go off of the horizon line to get it. So rule number three is down here. Now, there's a technical way to find the space and distance between the left vanishing point and the right vanishing point, okay, and the vertical vanishing point. And that's set up through a series of right 90 degree right angles or 90 degree, yeah, right angles or triangles, if you will, right angles. I'm not going to go into that yet. I'll tell you about how I get all that set up yet. I just want to talk about how and what we're looking at right now with three point. So to get your left diminishments that goes back to the left vanishing point still on the horizon line, Okay, because the box hasn't changed. What's changed? We've changed. Our head is tilted down. Our eyes are no longer locked on the, the uh, eye line, right? They're no longer locked on the eye line, uh, excuse me, horizon line. They've been moved down now 30 degrees, just like this guy down here, and now they're locked over here. Now our eyes are locked on our eye line. Anytime we say eye line, that's where our eyes are locked at. They just have always been, up till now, locked on the horizon line. But they're always locked on the eye line. Your eyes are your eye line. That's not going to change, no matter where they're at. 
So any of your right diminishments now go back to the right vanishing point. So we have left vanishing point movement, right vanishing point movement, but then you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, what's going on with this line, this line, and this line? That's three-point perspective. Now, verticals will diminish into the ground or out of the ground, any one you want to think about, back now to a vertical vanishing point, right? down here, the VVP, okay? And it's very important how we set that later on to get a true accurate read of perspective. But for now, you can think of a setting up with a left vanishing point, a right vanishing point, and a vertical vanishing point where all your verticals come up or uh, in down two, if you will, diminish and go down to number three, the vertical vanishing point. And now in this case, we have a three-point bird's eye view. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that we're above and looking down on like maybe a bird would. If this is a building, we might be flying over it. Or if we're on top of another building where we look down at 30 degrees, we would see what we're seeing now. And what are we seeing in our point of view, by the way? Well, let's take a look at that. We're seeing now the top here. Here's our top. Okay, we're seeing the left side over here diminishing to the left vanishing point, the right side diminishing to the right vanishing point, and now we see, we don't see the bottom because it's connected on the ground, but we see it in here, right? We see the back right plane in here, we see the back left in plane in here, and these verticals are now, they're curved, see how they're, well they're not curved, excuse me, they're on a slight change, a slight movement, a perspective distension if you will, that's my own word, of not being truly parallel. So they're not parallel anymore, right? They are converging and diminishing to the vertical vanishing point. The only line that would be, if we set up our corner, would be right on the center of vision. Sometimes you can, you can do that. Now, the more you get outside the cone, these verticals, let me pull it out a little bit, these verticals will get to more tilted, more tilted, and more tilted, like the curvature of the earth a little bit. So let me get back my pen here. So if I'm coming from, I'm shooting all these lines to the vertical vanishing point. You can't see me, but I am. Here, and then another vertical would be down to the vertical vanishing point, and see how this is just, this is a straight line in three-point perspective, vertical line, and look how curved they get. So look how distorted that gets. The further that we get outside the cone, we get much greater, greater distortion. So if you like that kind of thing, I think you should, you should lose it. I don't uh, use it. I don't have any, any, um, proclivities one way or the other. It just depends on if it works or not, in, in my opinion. And look, and closer it gets to the cone in here, right, the less distorted it looks, even though we've got a bending of our vertical lines to that vertical vanishing point. So utilizing the cone, staying within the cone, and staying within an even smaller cone at times can be really important, even when using three-point perspective, which also has some extreme qualities to that. You know, it's the same way if we were up on a box here, right? We're drawing a figure, and so here we are, right here, but then we look down on, my crude drawing, and we look down on a figure on a model stand, maybe this way. We're looking 30 degrees down. They can be quantified as a three-point box. So we might see this same kind of box that we'd set up here with our figure, right? Be something like something like that, and then here's the head, and then as we come down, well, it would be just the opposite. We would come down, we would get, they would get smaller and smaller in our vision. Their feet would get tinier and tinier, our little three-point view. That wasn't the best diagram, but you get the idea because we're looking now down onto these uh, particular objects at 30 degrees. So let me pull out a little bit, and let's do this. I'll take this layer off, and we'll look at it. Now a little bit cleaner and with it on again, you can see where if we clean it back up and come back in, we get a cleaner version now. And you can again see how 
uh, clean it is in our viewpoint, but we're still getting that interesting new visual uh, uh, viewpoint in three point, which is what you want. You get this and you get that, and this moves to a vertical vanishing point deep in the ground. And it is not the same as the station point. We move the station point because it winds up, if we put the station point here, they would be very close to one another and it gets a little clogged down in through there. But you could, you could flap your station point, put your station point in many different directions. It just seems to work out nicely right or left in that sense. Okay, all right, so there's the beginning of three point. The understanding here is to, is to know what you're looking at and why. Is it one? Is it one point? Is it two point? In three point, be able to recognize it quickly and know your point of view. Is it bird's eye? Is it worm's eye? Is it above or below or at eye level? Those are going to be very important attributes. Okay, let's go on to plate 21. We're getting closer to the end. Yay! Okay, plate 21, three-point perspective again. You see, the, you see the setup, you see some things that are similar, but there's some differences, and why? Well, we're now in three-point worm's eye view. We're a worm, we're slow on the ground, we're looking up now, tilted, about 20 or 30 degrees, our head's tilted up now, and we're looking at a three-point rectangular cube uh, that is higher than we are, and we've tilted our head to see it. Okay, so let's go over our, our four fundamentals first. Here's our center of vision, right? Here's our eye line. Now notice where our eyes are locked into. They're higher now, okay? So because we're looking up, we've tilted our eyes upward. Our head now has gone up to about 25, maybe 30 degrees, okay? And so that means that we've pulled our eye off of the horizon line about that, de that degree. So here's our eye line all the way across here, right? All the way over through here. We see that. Now if we drop down, there's our center, of, center point right through there in our center of vision. And then our vertical station point now is here. And we've drawn, that's number three, and then we've drawn, of course, our 60-degree cone coming out of our station point at 30 degrees, half and half, with a 30-inch, with a excuse me, 30-degree ruler angle. And I'll show you how to do that later on. I'll pull in a little bit so we get a little tighter. And then we've drawn our cone of vision using a compass, okay, and it's falling fallen all through here around that cone. So there's less distortion obviously inside and then more distortion on the outside. So let's talk about what we're looking at now. So if we're down below and of course here's the horizon line and so our eye is pulled off significantly from that again at 25 to 30 degrees. So now we have a setup of our left finishing point, which still follows, by the way, rule number one, okay, and two, okay, because they go to a single single point and it's a still still on the horizon line, right? So we have our left diminishments converging to the left finishing point. You can see I've left the lines. Our right diminishments converging to the right finishing point. Okay, so that was the same as the others, but now the horizon line is lower. Now the vertical vanishing point is pushed up off of the horizon line higher, okay? Now what do we see? Well, we're seeing our vertical lines diminish up to, right, the vertical vanishing point here, okay? And what do you notice is there's a little, they get dis, there's a little distortion, so those verticals don't stay true vertical, do they? I think that's what students have a problem with in the beginning is they see that, and it kind of freaks them out. It's, they're not used to, to seeing this, the extremes in nature or get set up. But when you know that, you can start setting yourself up in classes with the figure. And I do that in my classes. We'll put the model really high, way up on a platform or even a ladder, and then we'll get as close to that, la you know, down and as low as we can and close to that platform as we can so we can look very high up 
at them. And so it would be something like, let's see if I can demonstrate it a little bit better, where the figure's head would be here, right? And then we have the chest, the torso, and the, the pelvic region, leg here, leg, maybe in through here, just maybe just holding a pole or whatever on a platform. And here we are way, way, way down here. Student drawing, here's the drawing board. And student maybe sitting on the ground looking up, you know, at at the models and so we get that kind of view this is the same thing we're setting up now in perspective is a three point you know from below or worm's eye view and we're doing it and i'm showing you right now we're not even doing it i'm just showing you what we will do and what that looks like and so let's analyze the form in the middle um the three-point rectangular cube now because we're below looking up what do we see well we see the bottom right there BOT for bottom and then of course we see the right side and we see a little bit we see a lot of bit excuse me right opposite side there hello a little bit of side dyslexia there we go take that off alright so we see the left side of course and then we see the right side and then we can see if you know we're omniscient so we can see inside there's the top uh, transparent and in the back right, left and in the back right right through there we can see all six sides and that's important later on for structural integrity and for detail but right now it's to understand to get the vision down to get the a look at the procedure and see what it looks like you don't still don't know how to do three point yet and that's for a reason I want to walk you through that distinctly you might not know how to do a lot of it yet and that's okay too that's my job is to walk you through clearly oh and here was our center of vision I just marked it down below there which is fine now I see it so there you go that's three point worms eye view our eye is off of the horizon line from about from zero degrees here right to about well, I'm guessing about 25 maybe 30 degrees pushed up so our head front was went from a in our 3d position went from I'll draw it over here a straight on view which would be two point perspective right in through here here's our head here's a little eye there Okay, went up and did this now. Now we tilted up, here's the head, here's our neck, here's our nose, here's our eye coming through of about 30 degrees. So we tilted up now in looking up. And the higher you go, uh, the more, ex more extreme vision that you get. You can go from one, well, zero and 90 degrees is still one point and two point okay that's interesting to talk about zero let me write it over here in this section so zero degrees and 90 degrees is one point and or two point now i'm going to demonstrate this physically too in the next lectures after this so one one point and or two point right depending if you move your head swivel a little bit that is zero to 90 degrees zero and 90 degrees anything from one degree to 89 degrees is going to be three point three point perspective so there's a lot of leeway right for three point why do we use one and two point it cleans things up we correct it makes it easier sometimes we get very subtle head tilts like two degrees or 80 88.6 degrees or 85 degrees and it's just better just to go back to one and two point but when we get into 30 degrees 40 degrees 50 60 70 three point looks great and it's really really interesting so let me pull out just a moment and let me take all these notes away let's go back to uh, a, a non full screen view and I'll, I'll hold off that layer and let's look really quickly and clean it up a little again in what we saw so we had again our left vanishing point here whoops our left vanishing point then our right vanishing point and then our vertical station point here which was our our two-dimensional us right through here our vertical vanishing point up here at the top which gives us the diminishment for the heights another thing you can think about what this form looks like have you ever been to New York City or Chicago or London or Tokyo or Beijing or Sydney or wherever else that you live in the world and looked up to a beautiful skyscraper way way up there I can I can 
bring this down even further down to the street right we may be down there and you're looking way way up at the top and that might be let's say 75 floors of information that's that's how we get that view and the closer that we would get to that building the more we would have to look up here's our head looking up the more distinctive you know we're, we would be at about 80 let's say 85 degrees looking up that would be very very extreme perspective that could be very exciting to look at too okay all right so there's three point worm's eye view perspective looking from below up to our eyes are pulled off of the horizon line about 30 degrees and that's what makes three-point perspective three-point perspective when we pull our eyes off of the horizon line and that's done by tilting our head up and down okay up or down sideways gives you a kind of three-point but it's also two-point especially in a swivel so keep that in mind okay let's go on now to plate 22 we're almost we're almost there hang on plate number 22 you've seen this before but now you're seeing it with a setup what are we looking at a raised incline and what is that that's rule number three rule number three raised incline so if we have a form which is one I'll do a side view again we've seen this before and we want to raise that platform up right to there we'll use the same vanishing point as before but raise to whatever degree that you want the incline to be okay so rule number one and rule number two have a purpose of diminishment but now we have to take a vanishing point off of the horizon line where have you seen that before you've seen it in three point perspective both worm's eye and in also uh, bird's eye view so I wanted you to see this again with our fundamental force setup remember our center of vision and our eye line right through here right and that in this case it's connected to horizon line why because we're at one point perspective which puts our vanishing point right in the middle okay now that doesn't mean boxes can't be off center way off center I mean way outside the vanishing point and we couldn't just show that by framing I'll do a talk on framing uh, a little bit later and I'll talk about when you see drawings and you're like well that's a one-point drawing and it's not right in the middle of our page or picture plane oh yeah that's not that's not a problem you can do that too but in our truest vision our setup we are locked in because our eye line in our center of vision come together and at that right that point that's our one point vanishing point which is also our station point pulled out to our forehead or our third eye right it's like a radar line or a piece of string how far you want to go and so we can't get off that but what we can do is we can frame things in our drawing maybe when we want to if we drew a bunch of boxes and they were out here we want to frame it we can do that or we could frame it over here etc and so on so that's really exciting and that's something that film and video can't do right away but we can okay so that was rule number three now in our perspective uh, enclosed within our fundamental force setup let's go on to the next illustration or plate plate 23 we have our setup right we have our center of vision we have our eye line we're in one point right how do we know that we only have one vanishing point so we have our center of vision we have our eye line we have our station point which is our two-dimensional view that's us we can see us again and of course we're flapped out into the, the normal world of everything that we see out here right and then we have our 60 degree cone okay out and it, when it reaches the horizon line and then we give it a conic view or use just use a compass from the center and set your compass up and draw your your circle for your cone and now what we're seeing is what we're seeing rule number four locked into our 
fundamental four within the cone, so there's much less distortion. So we see this platform that's opened up into the earth, right? It's like a ramp going down into a basement, if you will. We've seen this before, so we'll pull in a little bit further. We understand then that rule number one and rule number two have applied, but now the vanishing point, because it's moved off of the horizon line, it gives us a decline. And so if we, again, if we drew this over here, what's happening? We drew our normal platform one, it's nice and level, going to our vanishing point, right? And then uh, our second one is going down to a ramp level. So we could be here walking, and then all of a sudden we have a new vanishing point. It was the same one as before, but now it's been lowered to the degree that which you want the incline to show. We see that now from the red arrows and the dots. So that vanishing point has been on the, so this is important to know, on the center of vision for now and pushed down to a degree that we want the decline. And now over here, of course, we could be here and we could be walking or doing whatever, going down into maybe a boat or whatever or some kind of pier, whatever it is, some kind of water basin or, or dungeon or whatever cool scenario you can think up in your imagination, okay? All right, so rule number four now, the rule of decline. You know, all parallel lines in nature recede to a vanishing point. That vanishing point is on the horizon line. That changes when we have a decline. Those declines will now still diminish to that vanishing point, but the vanishing point has now been lowered on the center of vision to the degree that which you want the decline. Pretty easy stuff, I think. All right, so let's go on to the last few plates. Plate number 24, one to go after this one. Cool. So have you ever wondered what happens when your head is locked in to the horizon line, right? And so you get just one and two point perspective. But what happens if it's locked in, your eyes are locked in, but you have this form in your hand like a box or like a Rubik's Cube or a toy or a doll or whatever it is, doesn't matter. And you can twist it and turn it in, in many, many different positions. Well, that's what's going on with that? Why does it look like a true one and two point box if it's a little bit tilted like this one over here just slightly? That goes back to rule three and four, right? We see that. That's kind of cool, but then what, what's going on with this one, and what's going on with this one, and what's going on with all these? Maybe these are baby block toys that have been thrown in the air, and we see them from our normal locked-in position, but they all look like they're relative one, perhaps two, but really three-point boxes. Well, what's going on is that's three-point auxiliary where the forms move, but we don't move our point of view or our vision. So the viewer is aligned with the horizon line, right? But the forms move and the viewer does not move. And there's a way to set that up too as well. But I thought I would just show you by sketching. It's a little bit easier because it's a more complex three-point setup where, again, our li eye line and our horizon line are locked in but the forms move, the forms change. So do you see the difference between the two? In three-point perspective, there's two, there's two visions here. There's three-point and three-point auxiliary. In three-point, regular three-point, right, our head moves. Okay? Our head moves, and we can move it and to be in three-point from one degree. If we're at one degree to 89 degrees, we're in three-point, okay? <clears throat> so that's three-point, and of course we can be in bird's eye view or we can be in worm's eye view. And then the other three-point is what we're talking about now, three-point auxiliary where we're at either zero or 90, and 90 was looking straight up or straight down, by the way, and zero is looking right at the horizon line. But the forms move themselves. now. They don't magically move, or they could if you were doing you were doing something magical, like moving it with the mind or whatnot, or the, or the wind could move them. You know, what happens if you have objects on a table and uh, a gushing wind comes in and blows them up and down or whatnot, or if you, if you set chess pieces on a board and the wind comes in and knocks them out, or somebody knocks them over with their hand, but you haven't been able to change your point of view yet, and we freeze frame that, what would happen? This is what would happen. This is what they could possibly look like 
And there's a way to quantify that in perspective, too, as well. And I'll show you that later on. But I wanted you to be aware of it because you probably draw forms, and you've seen forms drawn like this, but you don't know why yet. But now we can start to have a conversation in demonstrations about this type of three-point perspective. So we see three-point bird's-eye, worm's eye, and then we see three-point auxiliary. And we'll, a lot of times you'll just see me abbreviate that with A-U-X, auxiliary. Um, rule number three and number, rule number four of our four rules of perspective, you could say that rule three and four are auxiliary. Why? Because we have an auxiliary vanishing point from the, the, the regular vanishing point that we had for rule and uh, rule number one and also rule number two. Just keep that in mind. Okay. All right. So through, um, this was auxiliary three-point, a quick view and understanding, a basic understanding, and we'll get deeper into that uh, even later. Okay, let's go into the last plate and talk about a, uh, a little bit about the cone and some misconceptions of the cone and why the cone's important and how limited our vision is. Welcome to the last plate, plate number 25 and with this plate we're looking at a little diagram drawing of the Millennium Falcon and we have our setup can you see it can you discern it here's our center of vision number one our eye line and horizon line it's hard to see it's number two straight through there our station point we see ourselves right here number three and of course our cone of vision which is what we're going to talk about a little further here here now i've set our station point 14 feet we have 14 feet distance now from the millennium falcon so we're, we're 14 feet away and when we look out here in the broader spectrum that's what what the millennium falcon would look like let's say we're six feet tall um which is generous for me because i'm pretty t pretty short uh, which is nice hey not no big deal right and now we're looking out at the Millennium Falcon, six feet tall, and this is what we, we see. It's a little crop to the right as well. Now, let's take a look and understand the cone for a moment in our vision. We are visually limited, very limited in our vision, okay? I would say we'll put down here limited, unfortunately. Now, what does that mean? Well. The reason why we have the cone is a couple of things. To tell us where the distortion can and does happen and where less distortion can and, and, and doesn't happen, right, inside the cone. Well, it's been agreed upon by experts in the past, and I don't know who they are, but this is the way perspective has been taught for, it seems like, forever, that the distortion cone is 60 degrees. So peripherally, it's hard for us to focus on anything outside of the 60-degree cone. But if you really want to get technical, and if you really want to sharpen things up, when we look out into the Millennium Falcon, our best area of vision is actually in the blue section, or what I'm calling the 30-degree cone, which is half of 60. So a 30-degree cone is here, in here right and that's 15 and 15 on the inside just for measurement purposes well the total cone is here so that's 15 that's where you have your clearest vision so we're very limited if you try this if you try to do a drawing where you stay and look right at your point it's hard to discern things outside of that so if we're 14 feet away and we see the Millennium Falcon and we want to draw it okay we've got a drawing board in our host setup, and we're going to draw and draw and draw, and we look at just stay within our 30 degree cone, 30 degree cone, we're going to be very disappointed because we understand quickly that our vision is so focused and so limited, we can't see outside of it very much really at all. Try it, you can't. It's just impossible. It's, it's, a, it's a blurry mess, and the point of this is, is that how we really see an object when we draw is this is we see it in terms of several cones. Our eye looks up a little bit, so I'm going to draw a series of 30-degree cones. So if we're drawing the Millennium Falcon, we may look at the center for a while. We may look over here. There's a 30-degree cone, 
30 degree cone. We may look down here. And when we're looking over here, that's a 30 degree cone. There's a 30 degree cone. And we take all these different points of view and we distill them in our mind. So 30 degree cone here, we may slide over 30 degree, 30 degree, 30 degree to week so we can get the best point of view. What's really happening when we draw is our brain is adjusting. It's taking all these different viewpoints and it's controlling them, distilling them, and giving us a picture of multiple shots within our mind. 30 degree cone. All these cones, all cones are 30 degrees here. So 30 degrees is probably a better, re better representation, but I think 60 does nice too. But I think for our point of view, 30 is great, 30, 30. And so if we're looking over here at our station point, over here a little bit, over here a little bit, 14 feet away, which is the view that we're getting out from us right now, okay? 30 degrees, 30 degrees. If I want to draw this part, I want to draw this part, I want to draw this part, 30 degrees. 30 degrees, and we put all this together to a final drawing product, and we get a drawing of our Millennium Falcon that looks correct, that looks accurate in our point of view, but we're doing a lot of minor or minute changes, and every time we change, remember, every time we change our eye, we move our eye just slightly up. Try that. Look at something or look at this, this video and then look slightly up, slightly to the left, slightly to the right. That cone changes. Your entire setup changes, but in such a minor way that your eye reads it all the same. So we're doing all these minor little shifts in our brain and with our fundamental four, right, that it makes sense for our eye. And what we wind up with is a drawing that works whatever you're drawing whether you're drawing the Millennium Falcon or whether you're drawing a bottle of wine or a still life or especially the human figure the human figure is a multifaceted form of different positions from our point of view and we're seeing it from very slightly different points of view from higher up lower eye level and downwards and we're learning to craft all of that with our many different slight shifts, our slight cones, into a finished drawing. I think that's really important to understand. It blew me away when I learned that uh, as a student, to know how we actually see and now how actually the cones uh, operate, is that we shift quite a bit. So, you know, looking back over here, your eye, to draw everything, will have covered it and covered it and covered again. And so, depending upon how long you look at something, it's like, each one of these little little uh, scratchy circles represents your vision in a cone, and you keep sliding over and keep sliding over in understanding and making adjustments to what you drew the moment before and looking up. If you really look at yourself drawing, and I do, I watch my students draw because it's my job to help them, is you see them looking up, looking down, then you look up, pause, analyze, look down and draw, and then you look over a little bit, and you look over a little bit, and so your eyes looking all over the object you draw, whether it's a figure, still life, what or not, again, and again, you're making that um, multiple positioned view come alive with your understanding. Now, it would get really distorted if you were standing up, and then sitting down, and then laying down, and then moving over uh, five feet, that would give you very different points of view. Here our point of view, our, our cones are so similar but slightly different that it works out and we correct. A lot of times we correct what we see three point back to two point. Most of us see when we're drawing objects probably from somewhere between one degree and 89 degrees and it's just our eye that wants to, in our brain actually, that wants to correct what we're seeing and tighten that up back to a true vertical probably most of the time with slight positions with the figure. A lot of times we see the figure, if we're looking up, figures on a platform and we're lower, it's probably slightly three-point, but it just makes easier aesthetic sense to make it a two-point uh, uh, form or drawing. Whew, well, there you go. You made it through all of the slides. Congratulations, or the plates or illustrations, however you want to call it. You made it through all of them. Um, I hope you in, uh, found it informative. I hope you found it enriching enough to go on and follow me 
not follow me, but actually work with me through all the linear, formal linear perspective problems that I'll, I'll showcase at the drawing database over the months and years. So I'll do some, you know, formal linear perspective exercises, and you may not see some for a while, and then I'll come back and you may not see some for a while. And so I've got a lot of other lessons to take care of, but I'll always add to this series over time. And quite frankly, there are things that I'm relearning that I knew I was taught as a student. I'm going to teach you how to project shadows and reflections that I've that I quite frankly I forgot from 20 years ago and then I'm excited to go back and and look at my notes from Gary Meyer at Art Center College Design and and look at other artists and then also other books Rex Vickett Cole a British artist who has a great book on illustration or illustrations of uh, perspective that's uh, also a run wonderful um, book to have and I'll I'll, uh, I'll mention his book on my next lecture um, so Hopefully you get a lot out of this series, and it's something that you can use uh, in your own drawings. And, and I'm of the proponent, is like every, I think, every true uh, professional, that the more you know, the more knowledge you have, the stronger you'll be as an artist. And this is used um, by every industry in the applied arts as well as fine arts, and um, it's something that is a creative tool. It's not a burden. It's a creative tool. So get to the point, hopefully you'll get to the point where you can see that it is a tool to be bent, to be shaped to your will, to be adjusted, and to be controlled to whatever creative expression you want to imagine. Okay? Thanks a lot for watching. Take care, and I'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.